This episode is brought to you by Element Electrolytes. Now, Andrew, you recently started doing some fasting mm -hmm. and you noticed the difference with Element by adding it to your fast. So how has it helped? Yeah, it's actually helped tremendously. So when I switched to a like strict high carb, low fat diet, I was eating on a like a more like scheduled regular basis. So like mm -hmm. I would have breakfast where I normally wouldn't have breakfast then I would have kind of like something in between lunch something in between dinner that sort of thing and so when I decided that I wanted to kind of try to cut a little bit uh, I started implementing fasting again and dude it was a lot harder than I remember and I think mm -hmm. it's because I was used to eating so often so when I started implementing element um it, it's really as simple for me as like, it kind of almost felt like I was cheating on my fast. Uh, Mark mentions you have to occupy your mind and that's really what it was for me. I just, I had something, um, you know, something with really good flavor, but it wasn't going to break my fast, but also like it just kind of rejuvenated me. It sort of like gave me extra fuel to go further in my fast. Now that's kind of like the bro science approach to it. But for you yourself, you and Mark talk about some of the, like the, I don't want to say scientific benefits, but there is something more there than what I'm just saying. Well, it technically does give you something to actually make fasting easier because a lot of the times when you're fasting, right, you will have those pumps of hunger during the day. Um, but a lot of the times also you have pumps of hydration. So if you're not Ooh. adequately hydrated, yes. right, you're going to mix up your feeling of lack of hydration with feelings of hunger, which will make you want to go eat. But with element, obviously you're getting the adequate amounts of sodium, potassium, magnesium, which will have you actually be adequately hydrated. Meaning that now you won't get those signals mixed up. You won't be feeling hungry as often because you won't be mixing up your signals of hydration or feeling lack of hydration and hunger. So it actually will help you get through a fast much easier. Yeah, the hydration, that definitely makes a ton of sense. Um, if you guys are implementing fasting and you really want an easier way to go about things, we highly recommend that you guys check out Element Electrolytes. And you can do so by heading over to drinklmnt.com slash power project. Uh, check out the value bundles. We highly recommend that you pick up a watermelon flavor, at least one box, maybe two maybe three, maybe four. Uh, either way, you're going to pay for three of those boxes and get one of them absolutely free. Again, that's at drinklmnt.com slash power project. Head over there right now. On, on uh, TV for a long time. He's Now he's a big time movie star. He was a rapper. I mean, he's one of the greatest entertainers of our time. He is. Big Willie style. Big Willie style. <laughs> he has this um, YouTube series on fat loss that's coming out, or because he's losing body fat, so it's like a transformation. Yeah, he series. posted a dad bod pic, mm -hmm. right? Yes, he did. That was pretty legit. That was pretty it cool. Was. And I think a lot of people, <laughs> some people like hated on him because they're like, fuck you, you still look like a movie star. <laughs> you know, because he's still handsome and still in relatively good shape. He just got out of shape, I guess, for him, right? For him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, people were like, after you posted it and then you're just coming out of the series, they're like, oh, we see what you're doing. This is a money grab. But I mean, if you can get people to be more aware of like, you know, trying people, to lose How some, come people are so negative towards Will Smith? Just, they're I don't get towards it. everything. Yeah, that's true. That's true. right. It's like, yeah, they're negative towards everything. It's like, oh yeah, I'm going to make a series on this. Oh, I'm going to be making some money. F you. <laughs> yeah. As soon he as just wants more involved. money. Mm. Fresh Prince. I grew up watching that show. My first album that I ever owned was Big Willie Style. It was I had it on CD. Mm -hmm. That was the first uh, ever like um, CD album I've ever had. Summertime? <laughs> no, 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 no that wrong album. Before. Yeah, <laughs> that was way before. Yeah, I think this one was after Men in Black. I wonder when his first rap album came out. Probably in like 1986 or something, right? No, <laughs> probably like a long ass time ago. <laughs> 88 or something i bet you it's fucking in the 80s it was a minute ago but i oh, heard this oh go ahead i'm gonna say 90s let's I, see i heard this one song off of one of his first albums where he was actually doing a concert to a crowd oh god and <laughs> i can't even say it but he's like it was the 80s right so things weren't like eddie murphy made certain jokes right yeah so will smith was like if there are any agates in the crowd like <laughs> whatever you made a joke about that i was like will yeah, what did like, you just say yeah you're like huh <laughs> what oh man you're right mark 87 87 I, I was guessing well the way. song um the song that's in the beginning of fresh prince is mm -hmm. kind of his him and dj dj jazzy jeff mm -hmm. uh were together and i remember some i remember some of those uh, he, his like I, I don't know. I, I think that his rap style would still work great today because there's really not as much. Um, 
there's not as much as like, I guess, authentic and what I would kind of consider obvious rap. Mm. You know, sometimes rap is kind of neat because the words do go together. And then yeah. sometimes it's really amazing when they give you that change up in there every once in a while where one word uh, that you thought they were going to go to mm -hmm. and they don't go to it. And you're yeah. expecting, you know, when they do it a little bit like that. And I think that's the way the rap used to be. And nowadays I think it's just, it's changed quite a bit. Yeah. Well, now they just have to be more clever, I guess. But yeah, it was like storytelling. Yes. Is, is, is what he did. Yeah. You like know, Nightmare so like, on Elm Street. Remember that song? Yeah. 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 Like, you know, him, Slick Rick, like all those guys, they would just like take you on a journey in the mm -hmm. store, like in, a, in one song. And it was like, it was super entertaining. Parents just don't understand. Yeah. And then like a lot of that stuff went away for... I think a bunch of years, I think Eminem maybe kind of, you know, well, not kind of, but yeah, he has stories in his, a mm -hmm. lot of his songs Definitely and, does. and just like pure, like hype music. Yes. So what, what happened like get you was fired up for workout. Type mm -hmm. shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was that. And then, um, oddly enough, like the introduction of like ringtones. So rappers started making shit for ringtones. Mm -hmm. So it didn't have to make any sense. It didn't have to do it. So, um, oh, I didn't realize that. that, that Laffy Taffy song. Shake was like literally like the number one hit and it was exclusively made to be a ringtone song really and that's people are like oh shit you can make a ton of money by like putting in zero effort kind of like tiktok right now oh, man. <laughs> long Did form I, content you guys away. you guys know that i have a tiktok coach <laughs> Jessica. <laughs> well, I mean, that's one of them. One of them, yeah. I got two TikTok coaches. Is the other one <laughs> in SEMA? One of them's <clears throat> <clears throat> right over here. <laughs> Million and one views last night. Hey, hey there we go. Hell yeah. <laughs> you triggered the fitness community with that one on TikTok. I'm telling you, man. Good. I love it. <laughs> what happened? I didn't see it. <clears throat> oh, mad. Oh, mad. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now yeah, people yeah. are they mad. <laughs> they mad. <laughs> I love it. You getting mad, I'm Please getting say. rich. <laughs> <laughs> That's like my favorite song. That'd be my theme song. <laughs> That'd be your theme song. That'll be the, the you mad diet. Oh, yeah, you mad diet. That's why that platform is so good, man. You, you can put something out, but you, you, you can't put any explanation behind it. Just check it out. Just go. <laughs> Take it. And then everyone gets pissed. And then you can come <laughs> back and give them an explanation about it. <laughs> right? Oh, God. It's great that... Uh, it's great that it's kind of the first spot that people go to is to get mad, especially when you're trying to share information. Like that's legitimately just, I was just sharing information. I was like, here's what I'm doing. Here's how it goes. Here's some of the rules I follow. Give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're mad. <laughs> what you said is wrong. You can't do that. Yeah. Oh God. It's like shit, man. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking the other day, like, it seems like everybody likes to go to social media to, like, exclusively complain, like, even especially Twitter. Like, mm. nobody goes on there to say, like, dude, I had a really good experience at Phil's this morning. It's always like, ah, the line was so long, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I wish there was somehow we could add, like, a, like, a, I don't know, like, a three negative comment limit. <laughs> Just, you know, like, you know I, I it's hate, literally impossible, but, you know. I hate I mean? the uh, Amazon reviews. I hate those, because, mm -hmm. like, a lot of times when you, like, look at a product, like, I actually look at those to determine whether I'm going to buy something mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Especially if it's, like, a protein thing or some sort of supplement. I want to see if it, like, tastes good. Um, but the complaints are like, this product took so long, this was way too expensive. And it's like, that doesn't really have anything to do with Correct. the actual, like, mm. tell me about the actual product. If I could give this no stars, I would. Cause when I received it, it, it was, was broken. The box was destroyed. And it's like, <laughs> well, what the fuck does that have to do with the company? Like, that makes <laughs> yeah. no sense. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, damn, bro. Yeah. I remember uh, somebody had said, look for all the three star reviews. Cause those people are not like, uh, Whatever they're, um, because they're in the middle, they're gonna tell you that like, all, like the honest truth about it, which is like, okay, yeah, it kind of worked, but it didn't work because of this. Usually, the one stars is somebody who's upset, mm -hmm. and the five stars is somebody like just, from the company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they got paid to yeah. do it. Yeah. So the, the three stars are the ones that are most like truthful. That's really really smart. That's super smart. But you know what's <laughs> funny? It's funny when you you see a product. Maybe it's kind of new, or maybe it's not. But you see some reviews that you can totally tell that like. The company just had a heck of people write five star reviews. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. <laughs> like you see that you're like, mm, fishy. Mm -hmm. Why are they just every single day right after the other, and then they stop? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's like, uh, 
it's so positive. It's like over the top positive. Mm-hmm. Like they couldn't have any conjecture towards the product Life at all. Changing. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I thought, I mean, I think they have to disclose that they like, oh, I received the product for free in order to write this review or some shit mm. like that. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how that stuff works. I don't know. Jim Wendler on the show today. Yeah. That was the first powerlifting program I did. 531. Wow. 531. Oh, yeah. yeah. How'd it work for you? It was good. Awesome. I, I did that for Hex Cycles. Yeah. Cycles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you said it, not us. But yeah, that, that was, it was a great program. It was super simple to do, and it was just really straightforward. He, he keeps it so simple that people get mad at him, too. They're like, there's got to be more to it. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. There was a lack of like accessory movements, I, mm-hmm. like for like bodybuilder type accessory movements. He'll just kind of be like, I don't care. Like, just go do some. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, <laughs> he's pretty vague. He is. Um, but he wants people to execute the movements well. You know, that's, that's his like, kind of each person has their kind of uh, their thing, right? Their focus. And when he's talking about 531, he, a lot of times he's talking about, you know, kind of utilizing some powerlifting techniques. So in this case, he might be talking about bench squat deadlift and he would just like to see you execute them the right, like do the lift the right way. Mm-hmm. That's like the thing he cares about the most. Yeah. I think there was an updated version too. I never got to do it, but there was a, there was a second 531. I don't know if he ever made a third mm-hmm. one, but there was a second one, right? I know he made a few different versions of it. I think he made one for like football and he made one oh. for, you know, specifically for other sports, which didn't really have uh, too many changes in it. He was just like, People keep asking me to write one for football. He's like, it's the same program, but okay, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll write it and I'll incorporate, you know, some sprints and some uh, general physical preparedness type stuff. But yeah, he, I think right now, I think what's going to be interesting to talk to him about today is he kind of landed on this number uh, to help people get stronger. And I don't know if it's novice or if it's for everyone in general, but the number is actually really, really low. Um. I think it might even be just in the 70s in terms of gaining gaining a lot of strength. Wait, what do you mean number? Yeah. Uh, percentage of your one rep max type oh, stuff. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So he's kind of uh, stumbled upon hmm. um, after years of putting 531 out and encouraging people to, he always wanted people to really underdo it. Like the whole book, he talks about it throughout the whole book. Um, when you do your, it's a five rep max that you're doing, then the next week you do a three rep max and the next week you do a one rep max, but they're not maxes. They're supposed to be like more sub-maximal. Um, and more recently, he's kind of stumbled upon this number, which I think is like in the 70s in terms of your one rep max percentage. Uh, so it will be interesting to kind of get to, to that today and, and have some conversation because I think I think most people think that 85 to 92 percent, somewhere in there, is a, is a really good place to uh, do a large amount of your lifting. Oh, no. But I think that um, he has a really good point. Um, but it'll be interesting to also l- learn, like, you know, is that, is, that, is that with newer people? Is that with, you know, uh, more advanced lifters or is it, uh, you know, something everyone can do? I know he's had some experiences where, I know he works with a lot of young people too, so that might be something to have in consideration. Like they're, they're young, they're fairly new to lifting and the gains that they get are just different than everybody else. Uh, especially young, uh, young men, like just like the results you get when your body's, uh, producing that much testosterone and shit is, is pretty, uh, is pretty awesome. All the more reason to encourage young kids to train, you know, you got like a 15 year old kid and you're anywhere in your family, like go yell at him to figure out a way to go train. Cause, uh, these are some years that you could kind of reform your body. I think forever. Yeah. Slap yeah. on some muscle and be jacked for life. I really wonder <laughs> if, uh, I wish there was, Maybe someone does have an explanation for it because I think there is a difference, a little bit of a difference. The earlier somebody does start and get into the gym, especially when they're developing, because I notice that with a lot of individuals who have started younger, like when they're older, things just are easier, right? Um, doesn't mean that when you, if you start later, you're at a massive disadvantage or anything. I've still seen people that have started later and had amazing transformations, but there, I, there's absolutely something to that. The earlier you can start, the better. Me and my brother, we should just like, fucking go wreck ourselves it was awesome you know like we would go i mean i remember we would go and do deadlifts until we just literally couldn't stand anymore i remember we would like lay on the floor you know we we overdid it of course but just because we didn't we didn't have the information shared out uh the way that they have now and probably also weren't listening we had like older guys and stuff who Mm -hmm. (laughs) who were probably shaking their heads they they probably told us otherwise but we were you know doing our Mm -hmm. thing thinking we're doing the best uh that we can but those were amazing years. I mean, I remember um, just lifting for 
a couple of weeks after like after the football season and putting on like 20 pounds like real <laughs> quick you know it wasn't all muscle but i was like fuck like that you know and every year after the, the football season i would lose some weight a little bit and then i kind of learned that i could actually train fairly heavy through the football season i just had to do uh, less overall work and uh, less frequent workouts and then i was able to keep some size but yeah, every year I would actually kind of lose a little bit of weight during the season and lose a little bit of strength. Uh, but as soon as the season was over and I touched weights again, yeah, boom, everything just exploded back up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say probably like <clears throat> sports also plays a huge role for kids, you know, like I, I know for, so for me, like I did start playing, playing sports and then everyone got hella big and like everyone started kicking my ass. So it, it wasn't fun anymore. But my brother, he was a superstar in everything and he played all the way through high school and like he had like offers for like full ride scholarships but oh snap what sport do you play <clears throat> soccer oh, wow. um, okay. yeah he crushed it in, but he played everything though like he was like you know each each uh whatever team has like an all-star team that you know everyone in the area gets combines and then go play whoever mm -hmm. he was always on every single all-star team for every sport he played he just just naturally just a fucking great athlete wow had zero interest in it though <laughs> i know that's <laughs> so, so interesting but what i'm getting at is like for him so like these days he's got uh four kids now i Whoa. think i said that right um doesn't spend much time exercising he's still like he'll bike ride and he'll do things here and there like he's building a home gym now mm -hmm. after you know all the uh stuff that happened last year yeah so he's doing a little bit, not a lot, but he's still in great shape without like really needing to do anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, same thing with my dad, he played sports all the way up into his like, you know, fifties and, you know, he, he has heart problems and stuff. But like, if you look at him, he's, he's still in like decent shape, you know, yeah. he's getting older, so he's getting like a little bit skinnier, but yeah, I think for, for us, sports like really did save us because like my family, like my entire family, all my uncles and stuff, like everyone still like would, would drink into their old age, but because they were all kind of already in shape or at least close to it, I think they, they were able to hold on to a lot of that versus others that didn't play sports and you look at them and it's like, oh mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, some, uh, mistakes were made. <laughs> yeah. Being in shape can save you from a lot of potentially bad, bad habits. Mm -hmm. Like if you do like to have a few too many beers, but you're in decent shape, you're kind of protected. I'm not suggesting it, mm -hmm. but the truth is you're kind of protected. Yeah. You know, if you're in shape and you choose to go get a bit of fast food, you're kind of protected. Not suggesting you do it, but you're <clears> kind of <throat> protected. Yeah. And just don't forget, you know, having muscle mass on you, your body's working for you rather than you having to spend more time. Um, I think the time factor is not really anything that people really talk about, um, but where you spend your time and how you spend your time is a really interesting thing. Like if you are trying to lose weight, you're wasting time and, you know, people are talking about uh, time being money, right? And so time, if, if time is money and you are spending a lot of time doing cardio, but you're sabotaging your diet with bad food here and there, <clears throat> well, then you're wasting a lot of time and you're wasting a lot of money. Um, people talk about because you have to spend more time getting in shape. So I, so oh, just okay, okay. kind of think about it this from this uh, perspective. And I know that people are just always thinking about their immediate money issues at the moment. Like I don't have 60 bucks, so I can't get that. But I think if you are, if you have better health practices over a long period of time, you'll be saving a lot of time because you won't be running in circles. You won't be chasing your own tail. Mm. Um, I see people doing that with, <clears throat> a lot of cardio, which I don't have any problem with cardio. I think it can be fantastic. And I never want to discourage people from movement. I always want to encourage people from movement, but, um, I, I think your time is better spent, a better focus more on training, more on lifting weights. I think that's where your money is because you're going to build muscle when you build muscle and have muscle that costs you something, it, it burns calories for you. You know, a 230 pound person that has a pretty good physique is going to be burning X amount of calories more uh, than someone that weighs, um, you know, 270 pounds. That's a really high body fat percentage. So, you know, or even someone that's smaller, that that's uh, that's still fairly lean, but just has less muscle mass. They're going to require uh, less calories. So it's it's. Um, I just sometimes see people kind of spinning their wheels with a lot of what they do in training. Yeah, it's it's really tough. Like I I 
get a lot of questions from people like, oh, I'm like 18% body fat. Should I start cutting? Should I start bulking? Mm -hmm. Like, what should I do? And they're just starting. I mean, it's pretty tough. But like most people that are there, you know, they should probably just try to hold that weight and recomp. Just recomp at that stage, especially if you're starting out. Like, it's a good idea to just keep the number on the scale, the number on the scale, and focus on training in the gym. I think that's one of the hardest things. It's the, one of the hardest things is just to, to enjoy the gym, to enjoy getting stronger, to enjoy gaining muscle, um, and, and enjoying that aspect of things rather than paying attention to the way your body's looking consistently. Mm -hmm. Because if you're able to do that and your weight stays the same, you're gonna, and, and you improve your performance in the gym, you're gonna be getting stronger, which means you're gonna be getting bigger, which right. means you're gonna be gaining muscle and you're gonna be losing body fat. And that is just, it's just this focus needs to be shifted. What did the uh, guy say to you about bodybuilding and jujitsu? Somebody said something disparaging to you that was uh, like, you can't be like a pro bodybuilder. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he, he told me that um, like you're already a pro bodybuilder, but don't expect that you're really going to be able to do that much when it comes to jujitsu or like compete at a high level right. when it comes to jujitsu. And what we'll be talking about here today is kind of this very thing with the conjugate system, the, the whole point of the conjugate system and what conjugate actually means it doesn't have anything to do with board pressing and box squats and those things. That's what Louis Simmons made popular. And that's, he did adopt a lot of the Russian training and he did adopt a lot of principles of conjugate training, but the conjugate system is actually really simple and it could be applied to any form of anything that you do uh, in life or in sport. And it's really just the raising of multiple capacities at one time. Oh. That's all that it is. And I know that you're a big believer in kind of like, fuck what you heard, man. I think that you can be big, strong and lean. Yeah. Like why, why not? And it might take a long time and it might be, um, some unconventional thought and there could definitely be some, um, some merit behind bulking and cutting. Uh, but maybe like, unless you're trying to body build, I don't, I don't know if there's like, if you don't feel comfortable with your body and you you feel you feel fat you know you feel like you're fat i think that that is the best option i think a recomp is the best option i don't think i don't think necessarily bulking is a great idea i don't really think that cutting is a great idea either because we see heavy individuals try to do what they would consider to be a cut mm. and they pull way too many calories away from themselves and it ends up being detrimental and they end up having such a hard time staying on the diet yeah is is our guest here yeah he's here but i definitely we need to podcast about that whole topic. Yeah. Because yeah. I have a shit ton of questions for you guys. Yeah. Or at least some important ones for me. And like, there's there's a confliction in my mind that I have to talk about, but I won't mention it right yeah. here. Yeah. Whoa. Oh my God. He's Coming sideways. in hot. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in sideways. Holy shit. Look at that beard. That is a magnificent a beard, beard, sir. Wow. Oh, wait. I got, I got my phone. Hello? Hey, what's up, buddy? Can you hear me all right, Mark? We can hear you, and you look fantastic, sir. <laughs> I am in a hotel room in Texas, so down there. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm with Mason right now, and it's been a clusterfuck trying to get this to work. But I'm <laughs> finally. I think I got it. Here we so. go. Looking and sounding good. Yeah. How you guys doing? We're doing fantastic. Um, what's going on all with right. your son? How's he doing? He's uh, what in high school now, and he is he he's playing sports and stuff like that, lifting some weights. He's actually uh, a senior this year. No way. <clears throat> yeah, and he uh, right now he's uh, he went to go to summer lifting. So, uh, holy shit, dude! He's six two, two twenty. Woo! <laughs> yeah, he's making me look like he's a quarterback, which is retarded for that is that size. But uh, it's uh, I always remember the day that he hugged me when he was taller than me, like <laughs> hugged down. Yeah, and uh, it was very depressing. And that weekend, I beat the shit out of him with training. Uh, <laughs> so just to let him know, the old man still got something left. I think uh, <clears throat> fat, disgusting Jesse Burdick told me that your son hit a pretty big PR, uh, getting ready for yeah. football or something like that, and he wasn't even really yeah. lifting that heavy. And you kind of have stumbled upon, I guess, more recently some uh, what people would consider lower end percentages for people to get strong. And that's something that we preach here on this show quite a bit what have you what have you found and what were the results for your son the uh are we starting right now yeah we're yeah we're in we're in oh okay all right good so uh so to just to preface this over uh i guess the covid or whatever you want to call it uh he had access to a really good weight room 
and uh, he wanted to lift, obviously, for football. It should be noted that he's not like a lifter, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. He's not like, you know, do or die. Like, uh, he just wanted to lift for football, and he wanted to – honestly, it was like an excuse for us to hang out three times a week on Zoom. So, uh, and uh, so I just – I think we lifted, uh, yeah, three days a week or so. Whenever he had time, about three days a week. Anyway. Uh, to emphasize how he's not really a lifter and this, I don't want to like tear into him, but it's like, dad, what's uh 165? What is it? I'm like 45, 10 and a five. All, All right. right. And eventually I just told him what weights to put on. He had no fucking clue. <laughs> and all we did was like a circuit of three exercises every day. So for example, on bench day, he would do bench press, uh, chin ups and dumbbell squat or something. And then on trap bar day or, you know, whatever uh, press and dumbbell incline rows. So it wasn't, we didn't change up exercise. We didn't do anything fancy on the two other exercises. It was just sets of 10 or whatever. And I think the heaviest weight he handled on the bench was 165 for like five. I, we never did like PR sets or anything. We just, as I tell the <clears throat> kids that I work with, sometimes you just got to mail it in and have great, uh, great days or just good days, you know, and consistency is king. And this proves it. Uh, he enrolled at a new school here in Texas and, uh, his max out day, he did 235 oh, on bench man. press. <clears throat> and, awesome. you know, I, it's funny because the, I love working with high school kids, Mark, you know, that it's yeah, time you can really make a difference in someone's life. And, uh, it's always the seniors who finally figured it out. Like, don't worry about your training, Max. Don't worry. Just worry about doing the set correctly and pushing hard and, and, you know, the stuff that we all know. And it's like, God, I wish I had these kids for one extra year. I wish they would <laughs> because it all kind of blossoms in their head about uh, just doing the, the right things consistently over a long period of time. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I get asked this question quite a bit, you get like weird uh DMs, I guess you call them. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Why aren't, why don't you coach somewhere else? Why don't you do this? Cause you got, we've had great success. And uh, I can honestly say this is uh, control wise from like a egotistical standpoint. Like I have more control in a high school environment than I have anywhere in college. And especially obviously in the pros, I'm not saying I'm even qualified to work in the pros, but in number two, it's the, the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. And, uh, you know, one of the things as you get older, you get less stupid. You don't get intelligent. You just get less stupid. I've noticed that I'm still dumb as shit. And, uh, like, you know, I did, you know, Mark, you, you're on, you've done a lot of great things in your life. Uh, you've helped people like on the internet or, you know, videos. And I did 6 billion Q and A's, you know, on EFS and God knows how many emails and stuff like that and seminars. And it's, uh, I finally feel like I'm actually in service and helping people and not just because it's Mark answering, you know, this answering questions is great, but it's just kind of floating, right? It's, it just kind of, you just throw it out there and you eat there and it's gone because the next week you get the exact same question. <laughs> right. Mm. And, uh, you know, when you have one-on-one, -on -one, uh, uh, work with the kids, you can really, really do a great thing. So, and it's not just for football, you know, you hope it extends into other parts of the of their life now that's on them honestly but you got to give them some tools it's just like being a dad you know uh like i tell uh, my ex-wife you know when we have some issues with mason it's never really bad it's just you know, like you know it's his journey he's got to figure it out too and we have to be okay with that uh so anyway. i remember when i was doing some uh coaching a lot of the kids would just you know hang out you know way after you know we were done lifting yeah. way after practice and I started to kind of recognize like, oh, like they're like, I can't close up, you know, I was trying to close up the gym at like 8 PM or whatever and get to, yeah. to go home to my, <laughs> to my family. And I was like, I can't really close up the gym. I'm like, I got, they yeah. don't, they don't want to go home, you know? And, and then yeah. as we got to know each other, you know, then I would find out why. And it was just like heartbreaking. You're like, oh man, but oh, it's tough. you're right about being able to make a, a huge impact and, and kind of set some of these kids up for life with, uh, maybe they will keep some sort of fitness or nutrition or even just yeah. any sort of discipline. Maybe they'll hold on to that the rest of their life yep. and incorporate that in other aspects of their life. You know, just from a, because, uh, I mean, you've been to London, it's not a very big town 
and the amount of kids that can go on to play, you know, they might get financial aid for football or some sport. Usually, obviously it's football, but, um, you know, that's, they wouldn't have gone to college and you talk, and this is, it's just like any kid who gets, you know, comes from a poor family or maybe doesn't have that expectation in their family. And uh, we can talk about expectations later, but um, all of a sudden everything opens up and you talk about changing the, uh, the, the course of the entire family for the generations to come. And uh, so I think that's, you know, I look at my parents and what they did and what my, my sister and I have done and how we're just kind of, you just keep on building on what your parents did before. And it is uh, one of the shitty things. It's, it's hard if you, if you got to be the number one guy. Uh, you know, if, if you're the first person to really make some steps, that's fucking hard, but someone's got to do it. So it might as well be you. So fuck it. You know? So, you know, really, anyway, yeah. Mark, how's, uh, how's uh, you, how many kids you got now, Mark? I got two kids. Uh, how old is Jake? <laughs> uh, Jake he's gotta is be eight, 17. Yeah. He's 17. And, uh, Quinn is 13. My daughter. Oh Quinn. my Lord. <laughs> uh, so uh, far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no real. one's in no one's in juvie yet <laughs> not not yet not yet we're getting there we're getting to that real quick i want to say thanks jen because um you think yes. one 531 was the first program for like powerlifting that i did when i was 18 uh, i think i was 18 oh, or 19 geez. so that was the first time like I, I was training like bodybuilding type stuff up until that point but i was like i want to get stronger yeah. i don't know how the fuck how i was googling it and i was like oh shit what's this and i was like oh this looks cool and that shit got me like that 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 got me pushing in the right direction i did that program for a minute so thank you because i don't think wow. i've ever, I don't, I've ever met welcome. you in a minute yeah i love hearing that yeah it, it, it was amazing um but actually before the episode before you came on we were all talking here and we were like you know i wonder since you've worked with so many kids and so many high school athletes and also you've worked with adults um i would wonder to know if like do you see a big difference and maybe a mat like more of an advantage it might be an obvious question if a if a younger kid gets into lifting like do you think it changes the way they are as like in terms of their ability to make progress even as an adult or do you think yeah oh. you get where i'm going with this yeah well yeah. here's a couple things is um uh i should probably preface this is uh once we started winning we had kids that were eighth graders trying to get in and we allowed them in. Obviously we want eighth grade, you know, anyone who wants to show up because at the beginning we had great participation, but we didn't have a lot of numbers. So it was fair, you know, four kids come in. It's not a big deal. And then we started winning more and more. And all of a sudden we had 15, 20 kids and it was uh, crazy. The, uh, I couldn't do both because now we had more numbers uh, varsity. And then we had all these young kids and you cannot turn your back on young kids. It is. I always love to tell this joke, Mark, we, you and I, and 12 of our friends all squatting a thousand or more can have a Texas squat bar for 10 years and be, the bar would be totally fine <laughs> in less than a week. That bar is not lifting at all would be bent. Uh, by junior high kids, it is unfucking believable. What I've seen sleeves, their kids. I've seen sleeves break off of uh, barbells. I've seen broken plates. I've seen a plate broken in half. And I was like, "How the fuck did this even happen?" You know. And I'm back then. I'm trying to get stuff from you guys, and I, and I'm explaining it to you guys. You're like, "What the fuck?" I'm like, "These high school kids are most destructive people on the planet." I don't yeah. know. And uh, <laughs> so uh, my wife volunteered because she got tired of really bit hearing me bitch. Because it was every day I would come, you know, home from training and just be like, I'm so frustrated. I feel like I can't do anything and I can't spend any time with the varsity kids. And those are the kids that right now are going to help us win anyway. So my wife started a junior high training program for seventh and eighth graders for the football team. So now they have a kind of a pathway. Okay. So <clears throat> obviously the, the one thing I've noticed and um, is the first, I don't know, I'm just going to make up a number, maybe 12 or 13 years of your life will set, let's just talk physical, the metabolic uh, standard for your body. Oh, wow. So if you're for 12 years, you're not doing anything, you're just getting fat and just, you know, being gross, uh, <laughs> you're going to fight that for the rest of your life. I mean, it's going to be every, it's going to be socially, it's going to fuck you up. Mentally, it's going to really screw you up. Um, it's going to be more difficult if you choose to play sports because you're always going to be playing catch up. Okay. 
Now, if you have that good base, and I think, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, regardless of really if you're an athlete or not, just because you're out playing a little bit more and physical education was physical. Um, even the non-athletes were set up fairly well. And you can see that in adults today. Um, be, oh, as a prime example, uh, when I wanted to lose all my, the, you know, the West side weight, uh, it was easy because I had so many years of being in shape and fairly lean. I'm not ripped or anything, but my body just reset to normal. If you don't have that reset point, uh, mm-hmm. and that's not, it has to be developed early. It is something that you're going to fight your entire life. And all you have to do is, uh, look at people who are super obsessed with their diet. Um, who that's all they want to talk about is their weight loss or what they're eating and stuff where if you have a fairly, uh, athletic and healthy background, it's like, why don't you just do the right thing? You're fine. Because, and it's hard for us to understand the dilemma because, you know, we go out and run, uh, for two weeks for a mile and do some uh, pushups and chin ups, and we're back to fucking playing weight. <laughs> and, uh, so I really think that's massive and socially it is huge because it's very difficult going through, you know, elementary school and junior high as a bigger kid, it's hard. Mm. And, uh, and, and it's probably harder back in the day because it's a little, at least a little more acceptable, but it's not fun being weak and, you know, playing kickball and being out of breath or whatever. Um, you're, and I see it, uh, especially in the junior high kids. And I give them a ton of credit because it is, uh, one of the most difficult things because there's kids and I'm not lying. You guys, I couldn't believe this until I started who cannot physically do a body weight squat. And it is like, I like, how do you guys shit? Like, is there like a pulley system, right. you know, that, and so, uh, if you can get, I mean, you know, it's better late than ever. Uh, but man, does it make a difference in something? I, you know, the, the discipline with our kids, uh, and this starts with the head football coach. It doesn't really start with me because he sets the tone. And I think that's super important to point out is we, uh, we take one week off a year. It's usually the last after the last uh, <clears throat> after the last game we take a week off. Now there's you know vacation time, but very few kids take it. Uh, you know unless they go somewhere with their parents. But we just lift right on through, and uh, because we do that, we're so consistent. We don't have to kill the kids ever. We run year round, so it's, uh, ironically we don't run during the season. I, we found that to be you practice. We're a small team. You're running around for two hours. You're fine. Mm. Um, but we, our running is so easy because we do it every three days a week. So even if we need to, you know, condition up, we just add a little bit more, take a little bit out of lifting, but we're still getting stronger. So I think, uh, if they could take that and I always tell the kids, cause the, you know, we are a school is a public school and there's occasionally you see some people running around the track when we're doing sprints or something. And I tell them, listen, at the very least, just do 10 hundreds three or four days a week. Yeah. Just, you don't have, don't sprint them, just run them hard. Cause you know, at our age, you can't sprint. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, even if you run your fastest, it's not a, no longer a sprint, you know? And uh, you'd be surprised at what just that, just maintaining some basic physical capabilities in your body does. And uh, again, this is nothing new to probably anyone listen to this, but if you can get that in, uh, if you're a coach or a parent, uh, it doesn't have to be miserable. So anyway, you know, what, what, uh, people that hear that right now, if you're an adult or you're a late teenager and you didn't get going when you're younger, please don't let that discourage you. It, no, I agree with, but, but the thing is, I totally agree with you because when I think about it, like, you know, as an adult, when you're trying to start playing an instrument, right? It's fucking hard. But when you see some oh. six year old on a piano, they yeah. hear some shit, they're like, dee, 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 dee. and like two years later, they're a fucking aficionado. Like, you yeah. pick up shit as a kid so quick that, like, parents, if you have kids, get them doing some physical shit because you will, like, you're, yeah. you're totally right. You will save them for the rest of their life. Yeah. And it goes far beyond the, the physical health. Mm. Uh, it is unbelievable. Like, it's like uh, being like a heroin addict when you're young, you just, you, you're always, even if you're clean, you're still an addict. <laughs> and, uh, so I, it, it's tough to see, but, uh, and it, the funny thing is like, uh, I started doing, uh, a Murph every single day oh, and I've done it for 45 days now. Damn. Whoa. And when I started, I just did 
a quarter of a Murph twice a day. Mm. And the point being is like, I knew I wasn't capable of doing it. I didn't want to feel like shit. I hate. And when you have a family and you've got a business and you've got job, you've got all this shit going on. I can't, I no longer can afford uh, doing a set of 20 rep squats till I'm dead and then doing another hour of assistance work and then pushing the probably because I'm useless as a human. Mm. And Mark, you know exactly what I'm talking. You guys know, like you just, and that's fine when you're 20 or 15, but it's not. So to make a long story short, I just, over the pa- course of two months prior to doing what I'm doing now, I slowly just knocked away at it until I felt I was completely like normal and easy. And then I would just add a little bit here and there just one or two. And now it's like, it's just nice brain numbing work. And I feel fucking fantastic. I've lost 30 pounds and, uh, you know, I feel great. So, but the point being is I didn't start that on day one, you know? So if you, if you haven't really done anything, just do, you know, some push ups and body weight squats every single day. And it doesn't have to do if 20 is your limit, that's what it's going to be. Make get 20 to be easy. So uh, and it's unbelievable. Uh, when I first started doing it every day, I was like, oh boy. And I was like, well, that was it. All right. How can I? <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, it, don't, don't get, <clears throat> don't get discouraged, but don't put yourself in a position to be discouraged. Um, like if you don't squat like Dan Green, it's okay. <laughs> like no one cares. And one of the things I remember Jordan Peterson said is, you know, don't compare yourself with others compared to how you were yesterday. And it's just, man, just, and I tell the kids too, all we're doing is chopping it down a huge Oak tree. Every day we just swing the ax once we just make a little dent. We make a little dent. And after, and I always, I say this is a four year process. So we don't have to go fucking nuts right now. We don't need to. And then it, it always happens. The young kids come up like, I think I can do more. I'm like, I know you can do more but we don't need to eat it no more. And then the seniors come in, just fucking listen. Jeez, <laughs> we don't need to hear you bitching and complaining. So, uh, but you know, it, it's like I said, it, it's hard for kids to get, I mean, Mark, you couldn't, if you probably maxed out 60 times a week, you know, like, well, I feel good. Yeah. Right. Shoulders hanging off. <laughs> yeah. Going by how you feel. Yeah. It never like, works. Like, never one works. piece of skin. Like I'm feeling good. <laughs> uh, I remember after you, uh, so, after you were done powerlifting, um, you squatted a thousand pounds and had some great success in powerlifting and you wanted to kind of move on mm-hmm. and be healthier. I remember like talking to you one time and you're like, I'm going to lose like a pound a month for the next like two years. <laughs> and I was just thinking like, what a yeah, slow, right. what a slow fucking process that is. But you tend to just kind of be that way <laughs> in general, like where you, you like to chip away at stuff, right? Well, it's, um, it's meant here's a, it's mentally, it's much easier for me. And as someone two months and then they put it right back on Mm -hmm. and I learned, uh, and I didn't learn, like I didn't set out to learn this. It's just, uh, you have to develop great habits. And I remember like when I was in high school, um, like I loved to lift more than anything. Like it was everything and any kind of like hard training. It was, I love, uh, running hills because Walter Payton ran hills. And, <laughs> and so I had, I was developing my habits just through pure, like anger, hate, and motivation. It was just all emotional. And then fast forward 20, 30 years, and I no longer have a reason really to lift. Let's just be honest. Like we don't really need to do some of the stuff that we do. Like my wife says, like, what are you, what are you trying to be the Murph King? Who gives a fuck? I'm like, yeah, but I won't. But anyway, <laughs> uh, she, um, but it's those days, like I, I had this epiphany. It was probably 10 below and I lift in my garage. It's fucking cold. What the problem is once you start training, it's, you start sweating and then it just gets really bad because you got a nice thick, no matter how well you dress, it's just horrible. Uh, it's freezing now. And I was sitting on the bench and I looked, uh, I had a weight vest on and I kind of looked up and I'm like, what am I doing? Like. I'm miserable right now. And I realized like I did a full 40 minute workout or something with the weight vest. And I never questioned the reason. It's just, that's what you do. It's like brushing your teeth. You know, it's just, you wake up, you brush your teeth, put on some coffee and you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. But, and it's just, just the discipline of, uh, 
And those, that's what really starts to carry you. And I know like I, we, we uh, came up and that's the day I came up with the, we are one of our sayings and t-shirts says discipline and there's a line and then motivation. It's discipline over motivation. And that's the day I came up with that. And uh, what's the best thing is like, I didn't realize it for like 10 years, you know, it's just with what you do. And, you know, not, I'm saying 10 years after I had gotten done with real training and uh, cause it's, I don't know what, like, I'm assuming Mark, you're not doing any meets anytime soon. Right. Nope. And then you, I still love to train, but it's harder to train when you don't have a specific goal. It really is. And uh, I think that's kind of, that's when it's, that stuff starts carrying you. Just like studying. I mean, I hated to study and I have, I had horrible study habits, but I, if I would have done a little better in high school with developing those habits, it would have been much easier for me through college. So anyway, you know, the, the discipline over uh, motivation thing, it's, it's, that's massive because it's extremely important, especially when you're trying to change your body. And we were again, talking about a concept um, before you came on of, especially when you're younger with social media and you see all these jacked strong ass people um when you're trying to transform your body you're always so focused on your body right whereas if yes. you were to be able to be focused on your performance in the gym getting stronger just fo focus on the gym getting bigger yep. the body comes in time right i was lucky yes. when i started training when i was younger i didn't have social media i was just in the gym yeah. training and I made a lot of progress and I was like, it, it was easier. So how do you, how do you get the kids that you're working with who have social media, who see all these crazy, strong, jacked, athletic people, how do you get them not to focus on the way they look in the moment and instead just to focus on training? Um, that's a, that's difficult. Uh, the one we stress performance, I mean, you are in a sport, so, uh, there's plenty of great athletes, uh, that, don't look great. And now they're incredibly talented and there's a lot of other factors that go in there, especially the elite athletes. I mean, Roy Nelson is like, I, we, my son and I were watching some MMA and I was you know, laughing about Roy Nelson. And there's a guy who's not just a, uh, you know, a tremendous uh, striker, but he's a tremendous Brazilian jiu-jitsu and you'd never guess, but we, we've really focused on breaking records and the other thing is, at least at London, there's not a huge amount. It's a small you know, uh, city, and I know that doesn't matter in the age of the internet, but there's not a lot of kids who are really hyper-focused on that stuff. They're more focused on football. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, that's a, it's a different world in football than it is out in the you know, normal world or just the gym rat. And uh, w you know, I always say that you know, if you know, performance always trumps looks, if you don't think so. Ask the last girl you slept with. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. so hey and what's, what ends up happening? Like, I'll, you know, one of our, our, the kind of the way I train the kids is we always want to be in good shape, like just running, just be, we're going to be solid. And then we always say we bodybuild the upper and we athlete the lower. And so and you guys will know this. I've never seen a 500 pound raw bencher who isn't big. So we, at some point you're going to have to put some muscle on. And so even if your goals are strictly performance related, you're still going to look good because you're going to have to develop the muscle mass to do it. And I always, I know there's always people who say, well, my uncle who was 160 benched 405 for 30 reps. There's always a couple <laughs> out there, but for the most part, like th that's how we get our kids stronger is in the upper body is we just got to, we have to build muscle mass. So luckily those two go hand in hand. And obviously if you start eating fairly correctly, it doesn't have to be perfect, especially at a young age. But if you just start eating, you know, maybe eating, like we always say, just control. If you can control one meal, let's just do that to start with. Just control breakfast. Let's get that taken care of. Like, you know, if you're starting a new diet, some people can go 100% all in at the time. Uh, but it doesn't always work for most people. So we just take a step-by-step -step approach. Let's control breakfast. And as soon as you got, you know, after four weeks or eight weeks or however long it takes, once you get that down, then let's say you start packing your lunch or something like that. and. Uh, I always get, it's funny. I get asked the nutrition question all the time. And it's always from people who don't work in a high school or with like large groups of athletes. And I always say the number one thing, because <clears throat> they always ask about like protein intake and shakes. I'm like, listen, man, the number one thing, right. 
that step one is just get some calories in because so many of the kids don't even eat. Uh, and then we focus on the quality and stuff like that. But uh, I remember we had a nutritionist come visit the University of Arizona and she was asking about, you know, do you guys uh, really push the organic foods and stuff? And I remember our coach said, lady, if these kids eat pizza and drink beer, I'm a pretty happy guy. Like <laughs> you have to live in reality a little bit. And uh, I'll never forget that. I was like, wow. He's like, dude, they just need to eat. Most of these kids don't eat. So that's, you know, obviously a little off topic, but it's generally speaking, because football is so performance related, we really don't have that. And we give the kids ample opportunity to, you know, we call it uh, getting ready for prom or we call it, you guys win the battle of the bus. So when you step off the bus, that's the only thing that matters. Who cares about how you play? We just want to look beefy. Uh, so, you know, the kids know that, and you know, we have all kinds of stupid sayings and I, every day we train, I say, what's our goal today on this? And they, you know, we want strong, fast reps. And what about on our upper body circuits? We just want to look huge. I'm like, all right, now we know. So, you know, I think it's important that kids kind of understand what they're doing, but it doesn't have to, you don't have to put up like a, a diagram, you know, with a bunch of, you know, this thing goes to this thing and detail the Krebs cycle and stuff like that. The kids don't care. I don't even care. <laughs> Can people get stronger and faster? Uh, simultaneously, can we build like multiple disciplines at the same time? Yeah. And that's funny because people always ask, uh, Hey, do you ever do any conjugate work? I'm like, you understand that conjugate is just the raising of values all at the same time. We don't have like a hypertrophy block or a power block. These kids are too young and too inexperienced and too weak, uh, too out of shit, all that stuff that, you know, uh, that we kind of think of with athletes it's easy to get stronger and get faster at the same time. And honestly, like for, I think three years, four years, we did no direct speed work at all. And you know how you, you know, lose a pound a month kind of shit. Mm -hmm. Whenever I did something, I added it in and we, we beaded that thing, beaded, Jesus. <laughs> we beat that thing into the ground until I knew it was perfect. And then we would add something else. We never, I never implemented everything all at one time because it's too confusing. And then you do nothing right. So I said at the very, and we started, honestly, Mark, you're going to laugh. We started with dumbbell squats and pushups. That's all we did for six wow. weeks. And we slowly started adding stuff in. And until I was totally comfortable that if I was away or if I wasn't at a lifting session or whatever the reason, that they would know how to get shit done correctly. And that's one of the reasons why we don't change our exercises very often because the kids need to, you know, we don't believe, I don't believe in, you know, shocking the muscle. Like, you know, it's a, it's not terribly smart. Just, you know, do the fucking movement kid anyway. Uh, so, but we all got faster because we got stronger. Now the, the issue that lies here, Mark, is when people say that they'll always say, well, when you squat a thousand, you weren't fast. Right. And like, I'm not asking the kids to squat a grand. I just want them to go from 100 to 200. And you know who Boyd Epley is? Yeah. Yeah. He's the, for those that don't know, he was, the father of modern strength coaching. He was at Nebraska during their glory years from, I think, 1969 to probably close to 2000. And I saw him give a uh, presentation. He said, let's just break this down. What is your goal? You know, no one wanted to raise their hand because they were going to be wrong because it's fucking Boyd Epley. Even if he said, you know, touch your toes, uh, they're like, ah, I guess that's what it is. Anyway, uh, and after, you know, a few hands being raised tentatively, uh, he said, the only goal is to make your athletes bigger, more muscle. That's all we're looking for because it seems to affect the most things. Like we talk about getting str stronger affects a lot of stuff. When they got bigger, they got stronger. Uh, they got faster. Their agility went through. That doesn't mean you don't do those things, but that was the main focus. And if you look at some of the old Nebraska stuff that they did is on, they did uh, insane kind of circuit stuff twice a week just to build muscle. And if anyone's familiar with Nebraska back in the, you know, late eighties and through the nineties, they were, it, it my, here's the best way to, to talk about Nebraska. My wife, uh, Juliet, before she met me, like watched like a half of a football game in her entire life. And I put on an old ESPN classic of Nebraska playing. Now she had no idea it was an older, uh, football game. And so she sits down and she's eating and she's like, man, who are, who's this team? They're all fucking strong. No one's fat. And I was like, it was a weird thing. I'm like, holy shit, you're right. 
And uh, so that's when I really started looking to exactly. I'm, I'm a huge Nebraska fan, but I never really looked into exactly what they did. Remember the um, and, uh, uh, Lawrence Phillips and uh, Tommy oh. Frazier, like what mutant, like other players just bounce right off of them. No one could tackle them. They just, I know they were, yeah, they were it's, unbelievable. It's, and what's funny about their defense is they played, uh, I think a four, three, it doesn't matter. And only two of their guys, their two inside linemen were 300 pounds. Everyone else was 240 and just incredibly strong, incredibly fast. And, uh, so the Grant Wistrom, holy cow, was he just an absolute force? Uh, but if you, I mean, a lot of those guys, just because I'm a fan, I know of them, but you know, they didn't uh, have ton, you know, they didn't do well in the pros or even go to the pros, but my God, could they play? And so that's been for the last three years, it's really been our focus is just we build muscle and in the process, we tend to get stronger and uh, we just keep our conditioning really solid and we, we do mobility, you know, obviously every day. And then during the season, yours truly runs the two yoga sessions for recovery. <laughs> so it's, Oh dude, it's bad. The kids I are probably uh, names. because they're getting like bigger and they're getting stronger. Um, they're probably recomping their bodies and it's probably uh, more likely you're starting to see some of these young men pop their shirts off during the workouts and stuff. Then oh. they're building a lot of confidence and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a rule that uh -oh. if it's uh, if they're outside and the the seniors decide to quote pop tops, everyone's got to take their shirt off, and it's probably the worst part of my life. <laughs> Just a bunch of pale, gross kids. With their shirt. <laughs> I let them know too. I'm like, God, everything, everything's horrible in my life right now. So, but yeah, <laughs> and it's funny because with the junior high kids, my wife sees a massive change after about a year. They start strutting around. The coaches notice it. The kids get a little, ah, oh, but you know this. They get super confident. Right. <clears throat> and it, again, that goes beyond just uh, the, the playing that goes right. in their social lives too. You know, they have developed confidence in themselves. And the other thing is, you know, it shows you that, man, if I apply myself to something and just commit to it, man, can I make changes? And you talk about something that will carry over if you can apply that to whatever you're going to do. Um, I mean, Mark, you're the perfect example, right? You had a, you know, you were never going to technically be what a businessman, right? Or any, anything right. remotely successful. And it took you a long time, a long fucking time. Uh, so I think that, you know, the, the more, the older I get, the more I realize all this stuff. So, uh, boy, are the kids lucky to have me huh? <laughs> teaching them. <laughs> Uh, you, you mentioned a little bit about recovery, but um, how are you um, taking care of the kids and making sure that they don't get injured or get anything like that? Okay, so uh, we have a saying in a weight room that says, we never get hurt here. Where do we get hurt? On the field. Hmm. And uh, so football is 100% injury potential. And once you accept that, it's like uh, everything kind of is, is okay. So there are a couple things we do. Number one, and this is the number one rule of Jim Wendler's recovery is you don't train like an asshole. So that doesn't mean you don't bomb yourself on Monday and then come back and you're tired on Wednesday and you could barely do something on Friday. So the number one rule is you just chip away. We have good workouts, good solid workouts. It doesn't mean occasionally we don't do something stupid, but if we do something stupid, for example, on the squat, we're going to take away something out of the running, or if we're going to run more, we'll, it's just a pro it's like a, a recipe. You got to have mm -hmm. the exact ingredients. So that's number one. Uh, number two is we don't do a ton of barbell volume. And, uh, ironically, I didn't realize I was doing this as much as I thought until I saw a recent podcast with Louie and he talked about, uh, one of the reasons why, and this is kind of funny, but why their <laughs> West side is less injuries than other gyms. And I'm not sure how there's, but that's what he claimed. And he said, one of the big things is the barbell volume is generally lower in that program. And you build the volume by what Mark? Come on. I don't know. Assistance, assistance. Assist work. Oh, okay. So a lot, we build our volume through assistance work and that's generally a lot easier to recover from. Obviously like push ups, and we do a ton of tons of chin ups and push ups and dumbbell squats and rows. So I think that's another major factor. And, uh, let's see. The other thing is we do a ton of mobility yoga style work. And that's just, I probably needed that more than I realized, especially, um, 
obviously when I was powerlifting, but even in high school, when we stretched all the time and did all that stuff, but you know how it goes. If, if you're not in a group setting with, you know, some dude telling you what to do, it seems to, that seems to slip more than anything else. Like, you know, you push the prowler before you do mobility work, generally speaking, that's how much it sucks. You'd rather, you know, throw up <laughs> than uh, do some stuff. So I think the combination of that, and then on the field, the other thing that we do as far as practice is we, and I've told this story many times, my first year I was a sport coach. Uh, so I helped out on the field and then the head coach was the strength coach. And I told him about two weeks into this, you know, into me being there, just let me handle this. I'll take this off your plate. I know what I'm doing. And, uh, so we had a very bad year. My first year is we went, I think we won three games. And so in, during that off season, um, I was in charge of everything and, the head coach and I would talk every day about, you know, he'd come to training. And I said, listen, man, we need to look at things differently because what we're doing is not working. And so we kind of came up with the George Costanza thing. Uh, let's just do everything opposite. So we took out two a days. We don't do two a days anymore. What's the point? The kids are already in great shape. That was the reason that we had two a days. Number two is we don't need to run them during the like fourth quarter work in the season. They're already running around. Why make them tired? The example that I always use is, Mark, if you and I had a bench press contest on Friday, you wouldn't bench heavy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then would you be surprised if you took a giant dump on Friday? No. So why, why don't we uh, approach the game like we approach uh, you know, powerlifting or whatever you want to say? So we started backing off on that. And then we, <clears throat> this is, you can't really quantify this. Uh, and I take them through their uh, uh, pre-practice warm-up. And we do a variety of drills and gymnastic stuff. And the kids look horrible. Or if there's starts, we do a variety of starts to warm up to. If they look horrible, I'll go over to the coach. And we always have a meeting right after warmups. And he says, what do you think? You, you got to take it easy, man. You have to take it easy. Uh, or, you know what? The kids are ready to go. And I, we always have a saying here, just don't fuck it up. Whatever you do, it's in your hands now. I'm, I've given them to you. You know, next, you know, during the weight room, that's my job. So just don't screw this up, bro. So now our practices aren't just beating the kids down. And one of the funny things, and I wrote this the other day to someone, is in football, and I'm sure it's like wrestling too, and probably MMA, when the kids are really tired and really weak, uh, the answer the coaches have is to make them weaker, make them more tired. And that's not the answer. The answer is uh, we need a little more rest. Now, the hard thing is that the, the juniors and seniors have to take advantage of that. It's just not an off day. They have to be smart about what they're doing. So you need a lot of maturity. Now, over the years, we've built this up and we've had some great senior classes, especially the first senior class I had after uh, my first full off season. They took care of business uh, and they had high expectations for everyone. Uh, so when they had, when it was a light practice, they still, we're mentally in tune and we always, and we don't, uh, we rarely hit at all during practice because again, most of our kids both go both ways. And, you know, we have all of our football team, for example, is uh freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. We don't really, we have a JV team, but they just practice with us. We don't have enough bodies. And uh, so most of the kids play both ways. So we, <clears throat> we can't afford to lose someone. Uh, especially during something dumb like practice or lifting or anything like that. So I think that's one of the tricks of staying healthy is you got to put the kids early on in a good position so that they can occasionally take it easy. And uh, like one of the examples, uh, this is not exactly it, but uh, we had graduation and the field wasn't open to do prowler work. We do prowlers every Friday. It's like our thing. And I, the kids were, you know, like, oh, that sucks. I'm like, yeah, but we do the prowler every Friday. It's okay. We missed a day. We're still going to be able to do something. We're going to run. We'll be fine. So if you consistently do stuff over time, it's okay if you have to take a week off, not a week off, but, a, you know, we have to, you know, amend or change something. So, and, uh, and the other thing is, and this is no, uh, nothing new is <clears throat> the stronger and better shape you are, you're magically less uh, likely to get injured. Now there's always freak stuff that happens and that's just part of football or part of any sport really. But you got to put yourself in the position to be healthy. And I think that's one of the great things. And you guys remember Roger Craig, 
Yeah, mm-hmm. 49ers, yep. Yeah, I, I love Roger Craig. Uh, first 1,000-yard uh, rushing and receiving back in the NFL. Uh, doesn't get the attention he has. I remember on a Sunday, he got a uh, tackled low, and the helmet went right into his one of his knees. And there were, you know, Roger Craig's out for the, for the year. The next day on Monday, he was out running. <laughs> and uh, now that's, again, that's a lot of luck, too. But Roger Craig took care of his body. And magically, where'd he go to school? Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah, he was shredded, so, too. I remember he was in great shape. Yeah. And you know what's crazy? He weighed 225 pounds. He wasn't a small dude. Mm. And it, he'd be big today. It's right. like Jim Brown. Jim Brown would be a giant running back today. Can you imagine him <laughs> like back in the day, like trying to tackle that guy? Yeah, wasn't he like oh. 230 or something or something like that? Some, yeah. Right? Yeah, he's 230, 240s. And I met Jim Brown when I went uh, to visit Buddy Morris and Mislinski down in the Browns. Uh, Jim Brown was in the in the building. And I got to meet him. Even he was probably seventy some odd years old. Fucking giant still. <laughs> his his hands just you know crushed me. So uh, it was a pretty cool to, to meet him. That's my dad's favorite all time running back. And so I got you know I grew up in Walter Payton. Barry Sanders to me is the greatest running back of all time. Walter <laughs> Payton is the greatest football player of all time. Uh, but I, I still give homage to Jim Brown just because my old man didn't. He's got my respect, does my dad. So, uh, but uh, anyway, so there you go. Where you does know, uh, I, I, go ahead? No, to say, where does Jerry Rice fit on that list? Uh, <laughs> I don't count receivers as football players, really. <laughs> <laughs> but Jerry, and it's funny because I, I was uh, my old, oldest son, Mason, he loves football and he's like an encyclopedia, just like I was when I was a kid. So, if I have any question about any player, about where they went to high school. What their forty yard dash was in their sophomore year, he always knows everything. Just you know, it's uh, it's funny how the torch gets passed. And we were talking about Jerry Rice, and we watched some highlights of him. Mm-hmm. And he's got the old Newman gloves on, which was basically like wearing uh, really horrible uh, winter gloves. <laughs> There's no sticky on those, uh-huh. and he's making these incredible catches. He's so fluid. And I remember when he got drafted. Everyone thought that it was a stupid draft pick. Like, ah, what a horrible draft pick. And, uh, you know, because he was from a very small college, if I remember right. Yep. Like, I couldn't even tell you where he where he went to school. But um, so, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I think in the annals of football, besides Tom Brady, you know, being the best quarterback ever, I think the next guy with the biggest berth between second and first place is Jerry Rice. And uh, so... Anyway, mm-hmm. then you got like Julian Edelman. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Edelman made the greatest catch I've ever seen in the at the Falcons uh, New England Super Bowl. Oh my God, how he caught that ball! Anyway, all right. Yeah, uh, earlier when you uh, mentioned uh, Coach Boyd, I believe, right? And he said the Boyd, yeah, Boyd Epley. Boyd Epley. Um, yes, he said the biggest, the imp- most important thing is building muscle. Now I, I understand that football and weight training are intertwined like that's that's part yes. of football culture weight training yeah but even when i look at other sports like when you look at basketball and you, you look at like tim grover who trained michael jordan and he had this phase of building muscle basketball was still his priority but when he built muscle and still having basketball as the main thing he was better on the court and he was stronger on the court and it's not like he got yeah. over muscled and he couldn't shoot and he couldn't jump and i'm i, I look at all these sports and it seems that if the athlete just keeps the sport the priority and they spend time in the weight room building some type of muscle yep. that it's absolutely going to benefit them in the sport because it's odd. Some sports, like I do jujitsu, there's a big thing within yep. the jujitsu community that, oh, if you're over muscled, you won't be flexible, et cetera. But every jujitsu athlete that I see that builds muscle while still keeping jujitsu the priority yep. becomes a better grappler, right? And well, I the, feel like, the, the, yeah. It's, it's jujitsu is kind of like where baseball is still today. Um, and so I can talk all day on this. One of the things I always bring up is, uh, you know, when uh, Barry Bonds and Sosa McGuire and the whole, everyone was taking shit and magically what happened? You know, they were hitting the ball. Ball. <laughs> Yeah. And so, and I, I, <clears throat> so we know for a fact that again, if you get stronger and like you said, you keep your skill level high and it, we all know to, you don't need to spend a ton of time in the weight room to get stronger. Uh, let's say like you're an AAU basketball player and the, you know, they're year round. It's crazy, but all you're doing is raising your SPP, your, uh, just your skill. We'll just call it your, your sport. 
uh, you need to raise your GPP. That's weight trading. Mm -hmm. And so what I always say is quit trying to raise the ceiling, raise the floor. We need to raise the general physical preparedness. And an AAU basketball player, if you have a coach that really like a strength coach, even a sport coach that knows what they're doing, you could easily get away with twice a week and over four, five, six, eight, whatever they're going to do, they will become a tremendous athlete. And the results are fairly quick too. Um, But it's funny because, uh, you know, the muscle bound athlete, that was huge in basketball. And then when Jordan went in the league, uh, he got pushed around. You know, you're playing the Pistons, you're playing the Knicks. Like you got to be, this is a different era. And I remember that he just completely devoted, not he devoted himself to getting bigger. And that one off season, I don't know how many, how much weight he gained, but he was a different player. And the other thing is, it's like talking to uh, a 40 year old housewife when she, you know, she's like, ah, I need to start lifting weights, but I don't want to get bulky. It's like, dude, guys spend 30 years doing this and don't get bulky. <laughs> like, you have no testosterone, just fucking relax. <laughs> and uh, right. It's insane. Now, the one issue that we, I run into, cause I work, I don't work with, I answer a ton of Brazilian jiu-jitsu questions on training. And the hard thing is the sport coaches never deviate from their training to allow some physical fitness. So there's no real off season or in season. It just bang the fuck out of people. And what happens is they'll have a guy like Hoist Gracie or something like, well, he never did anything. I'm like, yeah, but his dad started or his grandfather started everything. That's how he lived, you know, um, for the average person, they need the, the sport coach needs to allow some kind of back off to allow this to bring up. And then maybe if you've got a tournament coming up, then this goes up and you know, your time spent training will go down a little bit, but it, it's uh, that's probably one of the most frustrating things is because you, the people have no uh, the athletes per se don't have much say in what they do on the mat. Uh, you know, it's, mm-hmm. so it's very difficult. And that's when, uh, you have to have hopefully someone you can work with, or at the very least, you're smart enough and can figure it out a little bit on your own. And one of the things that we do is with those athletes uh, that ask questions, I'm like, listen, I'll give them a you know a short program or something based on what whatever needs they have. And I'm like, it's okay if this is easy. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And the one issue that like wrestling has, wrestling especially, and I assume MMA, it's it's always a hundred percent. It's always a hundred percent. And one of the things I remember reading well, my favorite MMA fighters all time is Dan Henderson, just because everyone knew what was coming. He just stood there just waiting for his, his chance. And he, that guy, he's like the most unassuming fighter in the world. He looks like a really good dad and just <laughs> gives his kid a noogie. You know? And one of the things he said is, you know, he got older because he fought well into his forties. He's like, listen, I got six weeks camp. I stay in okay shape. I, I'm always doing something, but I can, can't go like that for 12 weeks or 20 weeks or you know infinite. So I give myself six good weeks. I really up the training, and I know I'm not going to be dead for the you know for, <clears throat> for the fight. So, um, but yeah, it's, you're battling a lot of other things that are out of your control. But the good thing is you do have control over your training, so you can make some smart decisions, and it's when you're dealing with that level of athlete, and I should say not the level so much, but that commitment and the work always err on the side of too little uh, because you can always add a little bit here, add a little bit there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or, you know, so it's better. And I tell this to the head coach all the time. I'm like, it's better to be slightly undertrained, especially going into two a days than overtrained. We don't do two a days. Uh, now I don't think we're undertrained at all, but if you're going to be somewhere, because once the season starts, you can never get that back. It's always going to be, you're always going to be dug in a hole, no matter what you do. And I, sport coaches really need to realize that. So uh, just be, yeah. And that's where consistency comes in. You just keep on chopping away at that tree. And magically, even if you're not training hard, so to speak, Mm -hmm. uh, like our kids, we, the way we've developed over the years, not a lot of people can do what we do. And it's just, it's because again, we raised the floor. So it may look, you know, if we had, a, we have new kids come in and we have to tailor the program to them, you know, dumb it down, so to speak a little bit, cause they just can't handle the amount of work. Mm-hmm. But to these kids, it's like, oh, it's a day off. You know, we're only doing this and this and this and this and this. I'm like, oh, it's easy. So, uh, but man, 
I'm, I'll stop talking. I, I'm just blabbing on. How do you I'm de- sorry. How do you deal with kids uh, having like some outside interests that maybe uh, aren't the best for football? Like as just as uh, you know, we were talking about like Hoist Gracie. Like I don't think anybody really wants to look like Hoist Gracie. I think people would like to be like have more muscle yeah. and look a little. Like, look, uh, George St. Pierre. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. so, so you have some when, kids that want to get like shredded and ripped and they're trying to diet and stuff. And you're like, dude, like you can't weigh 170. We need you to weigh 190. That kind of thing. Yeah, that is, um, we don't have that a lot, to be honest, but uh, our the only thing we've really struggled with is with people in the uh, outside trainers, so to speak. Uh, the kids think that they need to do more uh, or something like that. And it's happened 100, no, one kid did okay. Uh, so 99% of the time, the guy who's coaching them and I don't care how arrogant this sounds, doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, they squat 90 inches high. They may, uh, for example, I know this, they had a kid who could uh, 135 for a good solid eight to 10 reps parallel under control. He told my wife, well, we were squatting 225. And he, she's like, well, fucking show me. Show me what you did. And it was such an abomination. <laughs> And the kids really like that because they don't know the difference between a good squat and a bad squat. They just know there was two 45s on each side and they're pretty excited. So, uh, but as it was mentioned before, football is, is very culture training oriented. So it's either you get on the bus or you're out. Uh, now if the kid generally has like the, the severe ripped goals, uh, I, it's almost easier to work with because at least you can talk to him in a, uh, cause he's done some studying. So like, listen, we can still get you leaner, but we, you don't have to drop 20 pounds. Let's just, uh, you know, chip, you know, if you want to get a little, that's fine. And I always tell the kids, I'd rather have a 200 pound pulling guard who is, uh, incredibly quick. It can go forever than a 225 pound slow ass guy who will lean on you two different times. The first two plays and he's out the rest of the game. I'd Mm -hmm. rather have a bunch of fucking warriors out there who can go forever who may not look the part as far as like weight wise. Um, and I think that's really done a good job because again, we don't have like my son's uh, Mason's team here in Texas. I had his old school. There was like uh, two um, freshman teams and each team had like a hundred kids on it on the, just the freshmen, like 80 to hundred kids on each team. The JV had two different teams again, 70 to 80. And the varsity was just giant. So you have a lot of, you can make a lot of mistakes because there's so many bodies, but here we don't, we don't have that. So, uh, sometimes our, you know, we've had guards, you know, five, nine, you know, 200 pounds, you know, if they're lucky. Uh, so, uh, I, but again, I'd rather have a physically ass kicking motherfucker. Sorry about the language. (laughs) than uh, just a slob who, uh, on in the program looks really good. And ironically, when we do our program weights, everyone's like 40 pounds lighter and like two inches shorter. So then when they come see us play, you know, we have a kid who's like six, four, 300 pounds. He's like two, 225. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's funny. We had during the warmups, uh, we were playing a team and we just decimated this team. And uh, right before, uh, you know, during the pregame warmups, the coach yelled, they're not as big as they look. It's like, no, they're, they're as big as they look. You can't fake that. That was always one of the greatest, just weirdest statements I've ever heard from a coach. They're not as big as they look. All right. So, but anyway, I'm curious about this because it's like within powerlifting, um, and and it's still pretty popular to, for people to be moving 85, 90, 95% loads too often. Right. Um, yeah. like, uh, and it's funny, like I've worked with people before and they're like, this program's so easy. And then at the, like, I'm oh. not fatigued. And then at the end, they're like, oh shit, why'd I hit a PR? I don't feel like I was training that hard. And it, yeah. it's like, I, I see you doing that with these athletes. It, when an athlete gets more advanced more and more advanced, is it, can, can they still train in that way? I mean, I, I think so, right? Where they don't have to be killing themselves to continue to make progress. Or do you feel that as you get more and more advanced, you get into the numbers like Mark and you moved. Well, what, what is there a difference? Massive difference. And I'm going to tell you what, the higher you are, the lighter you could train. And uh, one of our kids, 
He is a uh, superb wrestler. He's got like the Vietnam stare. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's one of the most vicious people I've ever seen play anything. He's the most quietest, unassuming person. But you know there's something fucked up in his head. Oh, I God. love him. He's got <laughs> tremendous family. I've coached uh, his, his brother and my wife is now coaching his little brother. And uh, he finally really got it uh, recently. And uh, so we had to back his bench numbers down because he wasn't getting the reps that I needed him to have. And I, when I told him what it was, he looked at his paper and was like, holy shit. I'm like, just trust me because you can always go up if you feel good. But the problem is the higher you are, and I'm going to use Andy Bolton as an example, the higher that you are, the harder it is to hold that peak. And I was lucky enough to see Andy Bolton pull the first thousand. I think it was a thousand three. Okay. And like three years later, I'm not sure when it was, maybe it was a year, but it was a while. He pulled a thousand eight. I'll never forget. Someone said it took him that long to put five pounds on his deadlift. What's he doing? <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my God, you talk about no perspective, no perspective. So what ends up <laughs> happening is, and I've noticed this, uh, when I was, uh, powerlifting and even after i was powerlifting i was still lifting pretty heavy and some of my friends uh they pulled their best deadlifts with about a 68 percent training max and then another one of my friends i worked with who is my one of my longtime training partners he squatted 700 and the heaviest he squatted on his program now he worked up occasionally was 385 now that's extreme because now you're when you're the older you get the more you can and i mark this is the greatest thing you've ever come up with Fuck the bench thing that you do. What's uh, as you said, sometimes you have to rely on meat magic, <laughs> and that's I. Sick. And it's funny because in it's very funny in powerlifting. My best squat ever in the gym was eight twenty five, and I barely got it, dude. It was <laughs> horrid. Then I squatted a thousand, and I think that's something that some people have and some people don't. I think you can develop it, but when the when the chips are ready, you know when the fucking whistle blows you're ready to go uh and so you tend to get that with more experienced athletes they know when to turn it on uh and stuff like that you can't always be at level 10 when you're in the uh, gym so uh what i've noticed is the and again we talk about raising the floor um he, and when you get to a certain point especially when you're about an intermediate you start to really realize um uh how do i put this that 80% or 90% as a uh, more experienced athlete takes a huge toll on you. And as an example is, let's say you uh, squatted 1,000, 80% is 800 pounds. That's not like an 80% of a 300 pound. Like, <clears throat> Mark, you know, one half inch out of line mm. or one weird step, that squat, is, you're going to be done. And I'm even though it represents percentage wise <laughs> the same, it's just not the same. And ironically the same kind of idea exists for younger athletes because uh they may be able to bench 95 for 10 reps and you put 110 on there and you know the bar's tilting down somehow it ends up like horizontal <laughs> you know and they start licking the bar or something and so the same idea is it allows them to perform the exercise correctly without uh them you know with the risk of injury and uh, allows them to really dial in uh, to the actual set instead of worrying about the weight so much, they're just worried about, you know, keeping a good arch in their back and touching perfectly and pausing and stuff like that. So, um, it's just, it's, it works for both lifters, but it works for very different reasons. You, so, you see it a lot with athletes. We see it a lot in the bodybuilding community and powerlifting. Um, people are, they're in contest prep for bodybuilding show and they look like they're going to die cheeks yeah. all sunken in they're like can barely get up and down the stairs they're a yeah. useless human at that point <laughs> yep uh power lifters that are in prep are often like man like this prep is beating me up and they kind of say it like it's a badge of courage but the re back to referring back to like the meat magic thing you can't have contest magic you can't have game day magic if you're just crushing yourself all the time no and when i no. was squatting the big weights i i was usually using 405 one of my training partners was like i don't get it like how are you always he's like first of all you're always using 405 and secondly you're always squatting on the box then you go to the meet and you crush it and you squat a thousand and a thousand eighty and so yeah. on in in competition and the same thing would happen in the bench um i would use a lot lighter weights uh i would bench off of boards but when it came to the contest you remember how long it took me to get those weights oh, yeah. down to my chest i would do 20 second 
the bench presses, but I didn't practice that. I didn't do that in training. I just, that's yes. a spot that I would go to specifically for the yep. contest, but I was fresh enough and felt good enough going into the competition to where I had this reserve energy where I can be like, I don't even, I don't care how heavy the weight feels. Yeah. I don't care how long it takes. This is a contest. This is a competition and I'm just going to give it everything I got. Well, you can't, I mean, uh, one of the biggest mistakes that, uh, young kids make or uh, young lifters, uh, like power lifters is they always do the meat before the meat. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because they're like, well, I don't want to be nervous, you know, or I want to know I can do this. And it's like, I'm uh, still in here. <laughs> no service needed. Oh, hold on. It's my son. Oh, shit. <laughs> he's not, he's no not gonna, hold on. I apologize. No worries. Well, I'm, I'm going to actually take a pee break. Okay. Oh, and so the, the one thing I remember someone asking me, this was many years ago. It's, you know, uh, what do you do like the last two weeks before the meet? And I said, uh, I don't, doesn't bother me. Cause I did 14 weeks of, you know, good work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge, uh, thing. And, and it's, it's almost like they're trying to cram for a test. And I'm like, dude, you've been studying. You've been studying for you know three weeks. There's no need to go into the to the test day being exhausted. And uh, so that's where I think a lot of people start screwing up. They get a little nervous, like, and they always equate uh, more work with results instead of better work with results. And I think that's a huge uh, issue, especially with you know you're going to do your first meet or third meet or whatever it is. And once you kind of get experience, for the most part. Uh, you've had enough fuck ups and you're just like, listen, I, I can't do that anymore. Yeah. And, uh, but I am, uh, again, that just being consistently good day in and day out. And when we heard this message, you know, ad nauseum on just about every like special operator, you know, talking about, you know, the seal team or the Rangers or stuff like that. Um, well, that's another big beef of mine. Everyone thinks they're a Navy seal. You know, oh. <laughs> every, every coach wants to, and I always, I tell them, like, I remember, uh, we had, uh, not us, but we had another, someone who's peripheral to the program. Uh, they brought in like a Navy seal for uh, a week or something, you know, and they did all this stupid stuff and it's great. But the thing I remind them, I'm like, you know, after hell week, everyone's hurt and tired. Like they don't even like it. And, you know, I think, uh, for you know, it's usually like a two-year process. They're doing a lot of other stuff too. It's not one week. And first of all, most of those guys quit. Like it's eighty percent. Like you don't need that. And the other thing I always tell people too is when those guys do that, they're already in tremendous shape. That's not how you get in great shape. And it's like uh, I always say, it's you know, you don't need to use a sledgehammer to open the walnut. Hmm. And uh, so, but the, that I always love when. Uh, that. you know, it is all the great lessons you can learn from some of these guys like Jocko and David Goggins. You have to understand that they're already at that. They're already in doing all that stuff, you know, before, and they hated that anyway. Like it didn't do them any good. It didn't make them better. It's just a weeding out process. And you can't have that in athletes, especially young athletes. You have to, uh, and I do this all the time. Uh, you have to bring them in with success. And so, for example, any day that the kids, like we always have like a, you know, this is what we're going to do today. And then as, as I walk up the stairs to the weight room, if it's loud and the kids are wrestling, there's always kids wrestling. <laughs> and, you know, it's like a big circle. It's a big, crazy fest. If I, if I see that, then I know we're good to go. We're yeah. good to train. I've gone up there one time and I thought I missed practice or I didn't know the time because it was so quiet. So on those days, you just dial it back. And, uh, but, uh, and so every day I try to set the kids up for some kind of success, even if it's like, all right, we're just going to do our main lift and then we're going to do a push up, do hundred push ups. Everyone's doing hundred to 200 push ups, and they can do that, but now they've accomplished the goal. And so you, I try, and it doesn't always work. You try to put the kids in a, in a situation where they come out of the weight room feeling like they've accomplished something and they were successful. I don't want them beaten down. Now that may, that may work. Uh, 40 years ago or 50 years ago that may work with some individuals, but as a whole with high school kids, you have to charm them with their own success. Even if it's like made up, mm. you know, I have no idea, you know, it's, 
I have no problems telling some white lies occasionally to a kid, you know, if that's going to result in a better attitude. That doesn't mean I'm not, I don't have high expectations and the kids expect it. But if a kid's really down, you know, something happened, you have to like, dude, I, that was the best rep I've ever seen you do. And as long as it's like mostly true, I'm okay. Like you have to get the kids uh, to a point where they're, they want to be where they are and they feel successful. I know John, just, John Wooden used to teach, uh, kids to you know tie, or not kids the college players that he had uh, how to tie their shoes you know they had specific haircuts that they had to have yeah. and a lot of people thought that was to be in uniform and some of it was to be uniform but some of it was to go through stuff as a team uh but it, when they were done tying their shoes correctly and then and they uh did all the things right before practice just to get to practice he would commend them on that and that was that yeah. was like something that he was like, like, "Hey, you all got here. You all got your shoes tied on right. You all look correct. Everyone looks like a team. Now we're ready you to go." You accomplished something. Yeah, you accomplished something. You did. You did what you're supposed to do, and we all did it as a team. We all had to go through it. And he's like, uh, I guess, pumping them up from the uh, success that they've had just yeah. from doing that little tiny task. And it's that is a man. That's awesome. I love that. I'd never heard that story. And it's funny because I talking to Mason two days ago about how awesome John Wooden was. And I don't think people realize, uh, I think he won like seven national championships or eight in a row or something. Just I think 11. And, I think 11. So he did. <laughs> he run, he won 10 total. In oh, right, years, right, right, right. But he had a streak that was just insane. Um, and, uh, well, that's tremendous. And it's like, it's, you know, if you wake, wake up every morning, you make your bed. Like, at least I did that. Mm. And, uh, one of the things that I, did get from uh, a Joe Rogan podcast from Andy Stump is he another Navy SEAL who went through Hell Week and all we he calls it keep your world small mm -hmm. and I I been doing this for uh, since I've been in uh, college I always say just win the next battle you don't have to worry about the war so the next battle might be to take a shower uh, and get dressed and make your bed the next you know make sure you have a good breakfast so every day there's like a little battle and magically if you win all those battles, the war takes care of itself. And in terms of like, uh, training, it's just, let's worry about, we're doing our mobility. We're just do the best you can on your stretching and your movements on this. We're squatting, make sure this next rep is fucking perfect. Just worry about that. Don't look too far in the future. And, uh, it's like in a football game, it's like this next play is your battle. Just win this battle. And if everyone attempts to win each battle on each play, magically the score takes care of themselves itself and the good thing is even if you lose you're like dude they were just better that's all there is and uh so it kind of puts some ownership into their actions and their attitude mm -hmm. and un lets them understand that there is a direct uh direct result of positive uh structured ass kicking it's not you know and one of the things i always say is uh you know when you box you keep your chin down as soon as you start looking up and looking towards the goal, that's when you get clocked. That's mm -hmm. when you get the sniper, you know, putting one between your eyes. <laughs> Keep your head low. Take one step forward, little step forward, little step forward. And uh, magically, uh, the result will take care of itself. And more times than not, if you keep going and never pick up your head, you'll end up farther and farther and farther than you ever thought possible. And uh, I, there's countless examples of this. Um, and the, you know, the other thing, Mark, is you don't get overwhelmed. If you had to lose 100 pounds, you can't do it overnight. There's no – I was watching the Lakers play uh, – who were they playing, Mason? Who were the Lakers playing the other day? The Phoenix Suns. They, the Lakers were getting killed. Mm. And it's like, dude, there's no 30-point shot because mm -hmm. you know, they're all shooting threes. I'm like, just set up the offense, get a two-point, and then come back and play defense. Just chip away, chip away. So – well, I, I I don't watch the NBA at all, but man, do the Lakers look bad that game. <laughs> you know, um, this conversation has got me so hyped because like, okay, when we were talking about like, um, get, get yourself ready for the next battle and also having your training session be like a structured ass kicking. When I think back to like, when I was really focused on like, you know, gaining as much muscle as possible as a bodybuilder or like powerlifting, right? I'd like watch powerlifting motivation videos and yeah. every single training session would be a battle because I'd be moving weights that were too heavy, right? This is when I started yep. doing stupid shit because I was like, let me add some yeah. shit to 531. Let me add yeah. some volume. Okay. So <laughs> I under, I like, I, I understood, I understand that now, but 
the thing is, is every single athlete that's lifting is trying to have the feeling of when they leave their training session that they accomplished something great. And when the training session feels too easy and they're done and they're like, huh, well, I'm done. Uh, Fuck. Like they want to do more. Right. But you know, like, like you were just talking about, you mentioned that that lifter, that the highest he lift was 385 in a training cycle. And then he lifted 700. But yeah. I, I feel as if like a lot of power lifters, especially we know that if you increase your cardiovascular capacity, you're able to recover better from session to session to session. So it's yes. good to be in shape. So you can give yourself the feeling of having a battle. If you have some structured cardio, like sled pulling, if you do that well, it can be difficult. Yeah. It can feel like you've got something done, but it's not so fatiguing that it can fuck you up for your next session. Yes. Having a little yep. bit of a kettlebell complex or something where you maybe do yep. like some swings to maybe some push ups or something and go back and forth for a bit, that can make you feel like you had a battle after your big compound yeah. movements, right? But it's still helping you to your next sessions. And it's like if more people could, could do some of that shit, they feel better. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's almost, uh, it kind of comes back to building our volume through assistance uh, because as an example, uh, everyone has every weight for their main lifts charted out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we always cap like, listen, we're going to, you can go up to 10 reps, but no more than 10 reps or whatever. There's always depends on the week and the, and the kid and stuff like that. Um, but if they want to do something dumb, or if we're going to do some kind of, we'd always do some kind of a hypertrophy circuit. Uh, in the training, if you want to do like uh, something dumb, this is the time to do it. For example, we had a kid who did, we do uh, those full range plate raises, yeah. you know, all the way over your head. It's great for your shoulders and upper back. Uh, during his circuit, he did a uh, 45 pound plate for a hundred reps straight. Mm. That was his goal. Damn. And he was sore the next day. And, but it wasn't, uh, it's not like doing uh 10 sets of 10 at 405 on a squat where mm -hmm. you're really going to pay the price afterwards. So <clears throat> in that scope, that's like with the kids who are really into training, they always ask, Hey, can we do something dumb? I'm like, damn, yeah, yeah we can do something dumb because it's only chin ups and dips. Yeah. We're fine. We're going to be okay doing that. So we tend to do the dumb stuff, uh, with things that aren't going to sap you of your energy. Now this goes, it flies in the face of a lot of stuff because we all know the bench squat, deadlift, power clean, all that stuff is the king. But the problem is the king requires a lot of currency. It really does. It, re it saps you. And the other thing is, because I look at this as a four-year process, and honestly, we get the kids in seventh grade, so it's a six-year process, we, <clears throat> we can still pay the king uh, without having to look like the jester. And uh, so... But again, that takes a tremendous amount of coaching and it takes buy-in from especially the juniors and seniors who will tell the young kids, just relax. And uh, as an example, just talking about, uh, we, we have figured out, generally speaking, that if you are a starter on our team, the, <clears throat> the average starting deadlift is at least 415 on the trap bar. Okay. Now, obviously there's, we had a kid pull 585 for five the other day, which is insane. Uh, the heaviest weight he handles and train is 435. All right. To, to give you an idea. But we, when I first started charting these numbers, uh, we had, uh, now this was the entire team, including the freshmen. The average max was like four, 412 or something, 410. It was fairly close, but this included everyone. So it, you had the high guys and the low guys. And then I looked at their training maxes and we had eight guys with a training max over 300. So no one even came close to the 400 pound mark, uh, as far as the weights that they used. And, uh, it's always happens. Like we had a kid, uh, <clears throat> on week three of the program on, we do our, uh, the final set for five good reps. And then you're allowed to go up as long as you don't miss and do something dumb. So they usually have to clear it with me. And, uh, one of the kids really wanted to try 365. His last set that day was like three Oh five. And I'm like, dude, you're going to be fine. He's all nervous. He pulled 365 for five. And then you know how that is because it's the first time you did it. You're all nervous. And I, he probably, probably could have ripped off eight. And uh, he put that bar down and he looked at me like he had just got the winning lotto numbers. He's like, Oh my God. I'm like, See, just fucking relax. And then the one thing that I always do is there's always a kid like sophomore year who tries to do all the weights his buddy does. Mm. 
And I said, you, you go ahead and you can do whatever you want because it always ends up the same. They always, the next day they come in next and they're like, I'm exhausted. I feel so bad. I'm like, well, you learned your lesson. So sometimes you got to let the kids make some mistakes. Uh, the first kid that did it, uh, we trap art on a Friday and he, he wanted to go up. You know, I was like, dude, you're fine. You know, you're a mature adult because well, he was very mature. He wasn't an adult. Anyway, Monday he comes in. He's like, I'm never doing that shit again, ever. It was horrible. Like, I was wasted all weekend. And uh, so, but yeah, it's a, uh, he, as good as the lifts are, they just require way, you know, the big lifts, they just require a lot of you. And, uh, that's what, and I, I was a staunch, uh, hater of the goblet squad or the dumbbell squad. And then after I think two months of, uh, our varsity doing it, once I got hold of them, uh, everyone's hip mobility got better. Mm. And ironically, their biceps and their traps got huge. <laughs> Cause if you're doing dumbbell squats with a hundred, 150 pounds for sets yeah. of 10, 20, uh, it was like an unintended uh, consequence. And I'll never forget the, at the, towards the end of that off season, my wife came and visited. She's like, I just want to see what you guys do. And she's laughing. She's like, every lifter here looks like you, you have big thighs, big ass and traps. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, not, not now. I don't look like that now, but it's just, I, it was funny because I'm making them in my own image, you know? So, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I could, <clears throat> that's been the biggest thing. Uh, the biggest turnaround for me was besides the building muscle thing being, is just the implement of that exercise. And we do it three days a week. And again, we can get a lot of leg volume. We get a lot of, you know, good training volume without killing our backs and, and all that other stuff. So. Plus, the other thing is, if if it, you tell a kid to squat the one fifty dumbbell, they're all pumped up. Mm -hmm. If you put a forty five five and a two and a half on the bar, they're right. like, "This is stupid. What am I doing this for?" So yeah. it's a little mental game, you know. I always call it the the uh, like they always people ask me, "Do you guys give your kid choices?" And I'm like, "Yeah, chin ups or push ups or dips. You give them the illusion of choice. Act yourself out, guys." Are people still buying five three one? People still purchasing it every day. Yeah. Are yeah, you confused by that? <laughs> well, you know, here's an interesting thing is when I uh, was at EFS, Dave did some uh, recon work. And generally speaking, the average person that was like an EFS customer, like obviously you have like the, the lifers and stuff, guys like us, but you have, it's generally about three years that people are really into this and then they'd leave and then that new bash comes in. And ironically, that's about when training gets really hard. You know, you, you make your big time gains then you try this then try that, try this. And then all of a sudden you're like, eh, this is fucking shit. Like, <laughs> I'm not making progress. So it's, it seems to line up fairly perfectly, but dude, there's like billions of people on this earth. It's crazy. And, uh, you know, it's awesome. I'm insanely humbled. Uh, I'm not much of a business guy. You know, I, I didn't set out to do this, you know, with a, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't think this was going to be it. And, uh, so I'm, it's awesome. And it's, you know, getting the feedback, especially from, uh, I got, you get feedback from people, you know, been following you for 12 years and this is how I got my start. Or, you know, I started coaching athletes. That's my, uh, that's the thing that really makes me happy is when you get a guy like, dude, you inspired me to help out mm -hmm. and, you know, do what I can or, uh, with their kids and stuff like that. Just as you get older and I had, you know, I got this from a, a movie, but it's, you know, if you really want to change the world, raise good kids. If you don't have kids, coach, teach or mentor. And if you don't want to do that, keep your fucking hands off of them. So, uh, I just think that you can make, and then like, this is not the, obviously teachers are important and, and, uh, you know, music teachers are important, but this is how I, this is how I can help my community. Uh, Cause this is all volunteer work from myself and my wife. And I feel like I'm, I always tell this story when I got asked to help out, I was very hesitant because I'm like, well, that's my free time. Cause all I, you know, my, I take my free time seriously. And I remember I sat down and I was like, man, if I don't do this, then who am I to say uh, that everyone should be helping people? Because I know I have a chance to do this and I'm just a fucking liar. Mm -hmm. And my mom for decades fed the homeless at the church. Wow. And ironically, her cooking partner, and it was a Jewish guy. He's like, well, I don't care. I'm here to help. You know, it didn't matter. 
And that was my mom loves to cook. She loves doing stuff like that. And that's how my mom helped the community. Mm. And I, I was, you know, I was thinking, well, I don't want to cook. I don't even know what I'm doing. I can cook a steak <laughs> and I don't think that's going to fly. It's a lot of cash for ribeyes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so this is something that I could do and something I, I'm very passionate about. And I, you know, it's funny because I'm in the DFW area right now. And there is, I don't know if you guys have been here, but there's so many people here. And I'm always amazed. It's hard to get people to help. Mm. And there's like, dude, you have like 10 million people in this area. You're telling me like, you can't, there's not someone who can do this or it doesn't have to be all time consuming, but you can really give back and help people. Mm. And, uh, I think that's one of the reasons like the last seven or eight years, I just, I feel better about myself. Selfishly, I like to be of service to someone is a great feeling. And to be an integral part of the community, I can't tell you every time I go to the Kroger's or Walmart to pick up some food. Hey, coach, what's going on? And like, I have no idea who they are. <laughs> My memory's busted anyway. So I'm like, hey, you know, and it's great, man. The people are terrific. So what were you setting out to do with 531? <laughs> I don't I I knew. Uh, I had some friends like Zach Evanesh, one of my good friends and Jim Smith from the diesel crew, they had written some books and I had all these ideas and articles and stuff. And they're like, dude, just do it. And I was, my first thing I was like, no one's going to buy it, <laughs> you know? And you know, what do I know? That was the thing. What do I know? And then you realize that, yeah, Boyd Epley's better than me, but there's 10 million people who aren't. Yeah. And, uh, one of the things, and I, Mark, you know this very well. It's when you're at, when out back then in EFS, like it was huge. I don't think people understand the the kind of influence you had. And honestly, like I was like, I think I can do this. Like I, it wasn't an egotistical thing because I was always kind of you know not scared, but tentative would be the be the better word. And uh, I felt like this could work because I had done this for about two years. I've worked with people uh, at the gym and. You know, I made a lot of mistakes. Holy shit that I make mistakes with that. And once we kind of got some of the stuff figured out, I was like, you know, I think this would help people. Cause I, I remember writing about it, you know, different areas and it would got so confusing because people didn't have like a one source kind of place. And, uh, you know what, it's good to have a couple bucks laying around. I'm not all about the money, but, uh, it's nice to be a little bit financially independent. And, uh, when I was 19, when I was in my very first apartment, in Arizona, I wrote down a list of things I wanted to do with my life. I'll never forget this. And I, I was full of anxiety. I didn't have like heart palpitations, but I didn't want to do something with my life. I didn't want to just kind of mail it in. And I didn't know exactly where I was going to go, but I wrote down uh, work from home, do something training related and do something writing related. That's what that were my three goals. Cause I didn't want to have to go to the office nine to five and just kind of I don't know, just be a, you know, a cog in a machine. I think that's great for a lot of people. I mean, we need those people and I think they're, they're fulfilled. A lot of people are, but a lot of people aren't. And, uh, we talk about taking one step forward. I didn't know how I was going to get there. All I know is if I did well in school, I kept training and kept learning and kept writing, something would pop up at some point. And that's how I met Dave. When I first met Dave Tate, uh, we talked and talked and he's like, hey, what'd you study in college? And I was like, English. He's like, can you write? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you want to write some articles? And I had already written like 30 articles before this even happened. I knew I'm like, I just, you know, working on my skill. I'm like, maybe when something pops up, I'll be ready. And fair, you know, it's the old saying is, you know, when the, the student ready, <clears throat> the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And, uh, you have to make the most of your opportunities when you get them. If I let that slip, who knows where I'd be today? Mm. So anyway, there you go. I, I don't know. Like, I, I just wanted to help. Like I love Mark. How much free shit have you done? Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Tons. Most of my life is free stuff. Yeah. The, the job you know, that you have now is you do it for free, right? The coaching. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, it's, uh, and you get a lot more than you, <clears throat> Than you, uh, than you put in. And that's the honest to God truth. So it doesn't always seem like that. It gets very frustrating. I can't tell you how many times I walked home or drove home. Like, God, there's no one worse at this job than me. I am the worst. <laughs> like you're better off having a fucking gorilla coach. <laughs> and, uh, so, but yeah, it's, it's been good. So if anyone out there is, can uh, help out or do something with even training wise, it's probably better than what they have right now. Mm. 
you don't have to be the best. You just have to be, you have to care. Oh, yeah. You, you go, go to a kid's uh, baseball game, football game, and the parents complain about the coach. It's like, you, well, then do something yeah, about you it. Can you go, have no right. You can yeah. go assist. You can't complain <laughs> unless you have an answer. Mm -hmm. That's what I said. <laughs> if you don't have an answer, shut your fucking mouth. No. Yeah. Go help you out. Know? They're not going to deny yeah. you of, uh, of helping. No. They're going to be like, fuck, we got another person helping. This is awesome. When I first started coaching, I talked to the head coach on the phone and I'm like, uh, you know, like I'd have, you know, I've played football for years. I didn't really coach. He's like, honestly, can you show up on time? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Are you a warm body? Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> That's how desperate we were for people. There's wow. three coaches there. Wow. And now we, the amount of uh, resumes and offers uh, that for coaches to come in are overwhelming everyone, you know, so it's been a great, it's been awesome to build something too, because the hardest thing about building something is you got to get people to believe that didn't prior believe now we have all these younger kids come in there uh there's an expectation of winning which is great but before there wasn't that expectation and there wasn't the high standards that we now have so we had to get those kids who didn't really have that prior to believe in it and that's why that senior class my first senior class i give them a ton of credit because they had no reason to trust me none and they all elected to come in. Uh, our last game was on a Friday. They all elected to come in on the next Monday, hundred percent turnout. And they said, let's fucking do this, you know? And, uh, so they put a tremendous amount of trust in me, which that said, you know, those guys will never get enough credit because those guys, uh, you know, the way we, they trained prior to how we train now was completely different. Um, and it, you know, it was, it's nerve wracking. I've never, I always say this, that first game that we played after that first off season, Mark, you know, when you're warming up the team and, you know, ACDC or whatever's blaring <laughs> over the loudspeaker, and I have to yell to get anyone to hear anything. Right. And so I have like a very baritone death metal, uh, bark, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I'm like Raiders. And I, it must've been six times that I almost puked all over myself because I was so <laughs> nervous because these kids had invested so much in, in what I, you know, what we did and they believed in me. I'm like, man, if we fucking drop an egg on this game, everything we'll do is just for naught. And then we end up winning like 600 to two, you know, <laughs> Jeez. just insane. So, um, do you think that we, uh, people that worked at the people that worked at elite FTS, do you think that many of us learned to give away free shit? Uh, because of maybe indirectly through Louis Simmons, who we saw give a lot of time, a lot Holy of tons God. of free time. I mean, he'd take you to breakfast. He would, he would even be like, uh, you know, paying for breakfast and paying for lunch yep. and all these things. And then Dave with elite, uh, tons of free information. I mean, that's why people were going to that website. They weren't necessarily, especially in the beginning, I think ask Dave, I think was fake. I think his wife made up some questions and they kind of played yeah. off from there. And, uh, do you think we've kind of maybe indirectly learned some of this from, from Louie and then from doubt, Dave? Mark. Yeah. It's, you know, Lou, I'm, I'm sure at some point Louie had someone too, You're right. uh, that paid it forward. But in our world, it was Louie and then Dave, and then the, the tree just branches out. You know, you have two guys at the top of the stem there. Uh, and then it just branches out. And, um, I think you, the one thing is when I first started at answering questions at elite, it was the first, I did a meet my first meet and I did very well. And, uh, I remember, uh, that was Dave's, uh, IPA national meet. And, uh, I had already known Dave for a little bit and I did some stuff for him here and there. And then he, uh, He's like, dude, you want to be part of the Q and A? And I was like, what me? I know I can't. And <laughs> what people don't understand is when we first, oh, I was so nervous, dude. I'm like, I don't know. Is that what your normal like, inner voice me, sounds you know? like? <laughs> 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 and, uh, so I remember the, uh, you know, it built up over the years and, uh, that's one of the massive successes I had from when I released five through one, I had developed such a massive following mm. and it was not done with anything in mind. It was just, this is what you did. If you, when you're at EFS or you're part of the West side crew, you help people, mm. you help. And it's just, it was just expected and, and encouraged. And it never dawned on me that it would be anything other than what it was. And I think it happened it's, when things happen organically, they happen for the right, re like the right reasons. There's, there was never, 
Uh, and Dave always makes fun of me because I'm the worst business sales guy in the world. He's like, if anyone had no agenda, it was you. Because I never, I just thought it was the right thing to do. And you know, I'm not saying I'm a saint because God knows I've screwed up my parts of my life horribly and made some bad decisions. But um, that was one area I think. Uh, and I, I don't really do social media. I don't follow it, but I assume there's still guys that do a lot of stuff for free and help out because you talk about, uh, I mean, I still get tons of questions and stuff like that. Uh, but I don't look at social media really. It just, I don't know. It doesn't really interest me. Um, but hopefully what we help build is now branching out even farther. And with social media, you can really, you know, do some stuff and, you know, there's always a few turds out there. Uh, I remember one time seeing someone had made some kind of comment about something. It had nothing to do with me, but it had to do with training. And someone responded, I've been doing this for 18 months. <laughs> 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 and then I do the math in my head, Mark. I'm like I started when I was 13. That means uh, training knowledge wise, you're 14 and a half. And I'm like, God, I was horrible when I was 14 and a half. Like, right. I wouldn't trust anything I would from, from me when I was that age. And uh, like so, but yeah, my, that's a great way of putting it because I'm hoping that the branches get wider and wider and wider because it was awesome. And we weren't on the ground floor, so to speak, but we were very close, you know, very close. So it's nice. And it's, you know, I think a lot of it may get forgotten. Uh, I think, you know, I remember someone asked me one time, why do you sell your books? You do nothing for free. And I was like, God damn, dude. You know how many questions I answered for like, this is Dave and I, we, it was something like uh, 1,500 questions a month mm, damn. for like, you know, something like five years. And then, you know, another five years of like 500 or something like that. So, you know, it's like, man, you guys forget how this works, huh? <laughs> like, pardon me. Yeah. So. Oh, any Those idea people what, are few and far between though. Any What's idea up? any idea what gave Dave the idea to do that site that way? I, I don't remember anything else being like that at the time because it yeah, was well, halfway okay, like a I'll forum, you, but not really a forum. I'll tell you how it started. There was a guy named Jason Burnell. He had a website called Deep Deep Water. <laughs> yeah. He lives out here in and, California. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy. And I've always credited uh Jason for really launching the EFS. Q&A because he would put up all of Louis's articles. Louis would send him the articles. And then he had stuff like Ed Cohn's program or, you know, this, the, this type, you know, whatever, basic interviews and stuff like that. It was a very basic page, just like one giant <laughs> yeah, opening page, just click on links. That's all there was. It was really cool. And on there, he had uh, asked Dave. And so it was Dave Tate. So people would send questions into Jason. There was an email address and then he would send them to J Dave. Dave would, you know, put them on a, you know, email and then send them back. And they were updated maybe you know, whenever Dave had the time. So maybe once or I don't know, probably two or three times a month or something. I remember like waiting and waiting and waiting. One of his greatest answers he gave is someone asked, uh, how do you get faster at speed bench? And Dave just said, push harder. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Love that thing. And so I think that I, I know Dave had some ideas about, uh, selling some stuff and doing that. But I think the Q and a really rose from that because it was massively popular and, you know, people don't understand when Dave first started, I think it was just him. And then he brought in like Bob Young's and Danny Blankenship and Martin Rooney mm -hmm. uh, from the Parisi, the speed school and stuff who trains uh, athletes and fighters and stuff like that. And I think I was like the, uh, the next guy out of that group. So, um, it's, it's, it was really awesome to be part of. And I remember when I did my, you know, it's called elite fitness systems. It, it's not, it wasn't elite FTS back then. And his big thing was, you know, it's elite lifters teaching you. And I didn't reach my elite in my first meet. I reached it in my second meet. Mm -hmm. And I remember Dave like, I'm a fraud, dude. I was like 30 <laughs> pounds off, you know? And uh, he's like, you're fine. You're going to, you're all right. You know, don't worry about it. So. <laughs> I think that's, I think the, the Burnell thing. And I think Louis sold some equipment back then. I remember he you know, sold obviously the reverse hyper mm -hmm. and like a couple other things, but Dave really saw a market for that. And you know, there's another, I just did a podcast with Dave and Vincent and Matt Rhodes. And I mentioned like Dave, I mean, they're in a brand new building that, you know, they, mm -hmm. it's, they built it from the ground up. 
and I, I was never in there. I was always in like the dirty, dusty closets that, uh, mm-hmm. and that's how it started. And I'm like, man, look at what you built. I mean, this is insane. You know, just the weight room itself. Yeah. I mean, it's like yeah. we literally trained in the place where we answered phones. <laughs> there was a monolith there and a squat, you know, bench, bench rack. So, you, you know, you do a couple sets, answer a phone. Uh, so it's just, uh, it's, it's really crazy. So, and then obviously, you know, the success that Louis had has been astronomical. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I haven't spoken to Lou in quite a while. Occasionally, like I'd see him out at a restaurant or something, but I haven't spoken to him, but you know, he's still, still a stubborn, (laughs) smart man. Right. So, yeah. Dude, once again, uh, thank you. Because I've, I've not only have I learned a lot from this conversation, um, but like yes. I said, that that five three was the first program I started with, and I learned so much from that program. So yeah, again, thank you, man. It's it's again, awesome to hear. Uh, and you know, people always. I don't care what people do training wise. I just if I'm somewhat part of that in any way, shape, or form, uh, it's awesome to know because someone did that for me, <laughs> and someone did that for them, and. Uh, you know, it's Mark. Can you imagine knowing that you were made a lifetime out of a fucking thing that cheats you on your bench? Right. I mean, think about that. I mean, it's it's nuts. It's wild. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. And so it's just really cool to uh, to see the success that we've had and other people have had. I just I don't I don't take it for granted. You know. So, but thank you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. What uh, you have any books uh, that are like more recent? Uh, obviously you've written uh, some stuff after five, three, one, right? Yeah. There's, uh, there's a, fi- uh, shit beyond five, th- or five, beyond five, three, mm-hmm. one. And we, I just, uh, <clears throat> added a ton of more stuff and I wrote five through one forever, which is a giant manual. It's mm-hmm. huge. It's got every workout thing that I've ever tried and explanations about everything, how to program your training for long-term how to program the conditioning, all that stuff, how to do active recovery. It's a massive book. Uh, and that uh, has been the latest book that, uh, so it's been like five years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also asked my wife, we are some kind of, I don't know, whatever. So uh, there's a discount code. To anyone reading this uh, on uh, books? Uh, it's, <clears throat> we had to come up with something snappy. So it's West Side mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's, you know, West Side. Uh, <laughs> remember that? Oh my God. So yeah, there's a, a code. I probably last a week or something. My wife does all that stuff. So um yeah, what's your website? Uh, it's uh jimwendler.com. There you go. And you can find me on Instagram. Uh Facebook is we don't do a lot of stuff on Facebook just because it's we get uh it's hard to reach people on Facebook. It really is. And, uh, we've had some issues. We'll just put it that way with Facebook. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so Instagram seems to be the best and I don't do a ton of updates. I usually do try to do like a 60 second video where I explain something that we do with training with the kids or something with me or something I've learned. And then I occasionally do like a Q and a it's, I call it the fat fingers Q and a like, (laughs) listen, don't ask me for like 30 fucking lines, make it a, so I can answer it fairly brief because I, you know, uh, stuff like that. So. And, you know, uh, if you have a question, Wendler store at gmail.com, my wife handles all that. She'll just forward it to me. Um, so that's the best way to get hold of me. I check my, my personal email about once every month. Uh, so it's, I never do any of that stuff. My wife kind of handles all that stuff. So, and if you want to get hold of me, uh, email or text my wife, that's how all my friends do it. And that's, <laughs> I don't, not a big you know, phone guy. So anyway. Are you still going, uh, going hard with the music? Yeah. Oh, you know, the problem with, uh, when I was younger and like learning everything, I learned how to play drums when I was in uh, freshman in high school wow. and played in a band and then I, you know, played, played. And now I have such a sound, massive amounts of amps in my, uh, in cabinets in my basement, which is complete and total overkill. <laughs> like this is something you'd put on a stage <laughs> and it's in my basement. And so, yeah, I still, I mean, I have a, you know, two, two different drum sets down there. I have recording equipment. I have bass guitars, a bunch of different guitars and amps. So that's kind of always been my, uh, my outlet and my parents always encourage that. And it's, if, if you're a drummer in a band in high school, practice is always at your house, 
right? Because it's the hardest thing to move. So I always give my parents a ton of credit for bringing all these kids over there. And it was the loudest, <laughs> most, the worst music you've ever heard in your life because everyone's learning their instrument, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it's always been since I've been a kid. I mean, I, it's funny because the first time I heard like real hard rock, I was in third grade. I heard the song, a live version of Godzilla by Blue Oyster Cult. My cousin played it for me. And I, I was, it's like seeing boobs. Like, I don't know what that is, but I want more of it. I want it heavier. <laughs> <laughs> like when you're a young kid. So yeah. uh, you know, I was Oops. knee deep in <laughs> like them. Slayer and Venom and Merciful Fate when I was probably in sixth grade. So, you know, I had a, you know, back in those days, you had to know someone to know someone, an older brother or something like that, who would make you a mixtape of all these different bands. And it's funny because those are all considered the underground classics. You don't know. Like I had a paper route for three years. Every morning I wake up and deliver papers to people's houses and put my Walkman on, you know, riding my diamond back, chucking. That's the best job I've ever had. <laughs> oh, all alone, quiet. It's five in the morning. It was awesome. Jam and venom. Anyway. So yeah, jimwendler.com, uh, Instagram, wendlerstory at gmail.com. West side is the discount code. So there you go. Awesome. Thanks for your time today. And it's good to see that yeah, you're Mark. doing well and that you're uh, Thank you guys. kicking it with your son out there. And hopefully uh, your team kicks some more ass. Yeah. yeah one game at a time man one practice at a time so you, we'll, be, we'll get there have a great rest of your day all right thank you guys so Take much care. for everything see i appreciate you. the chance mark thank you see you later bro bro just like a typical coach he was dropping like so many quotes on us bro i was writing on every <laughs> single one yeah i wrote down a bunch of them too the king requires currency you know you don't need a sledgehammer for to, yeah to, yeah, to yeah open a walnut open a walnut bro just diamonds, gems, man, just being thrown at you right and left. I love it. I love it. And yeah. I didn't curse that much, mom. If Yay. you're listening. <laughs> she, she probably is checking up, but she'll, she'll check up in like two weeks. She's got a ruler ready <laughs> or whatever it is it that she beat wants my to ass. beat you with. <gasps> I said ass. See? Nope. Game over. Damn. Man, that was great though. Yeah. I, I love, uh, you know, because you, you look at him, you know, it's like he looks pretty hardcore. He's got that beard, squatted a thousand pounds, like. This guy's not afraid of anything. And he's talking about how like, yeah, he would be a little, he would question himself. Yeah. You know, it's like. <laughs> he had a lot of self-doubt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think we can all learn a lot from that because shit, I question myself all the time. He Same also, here, he also is extremely sweet. You know, he's a big teddy bear, like doing all this <laughs> stuff for free and he loves kids yeah. and you know, he's doing stuff obviously uh, for his own kid, but he's doing stuff for other people's kids and it's fucking awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. Second. Yeah, doing it for free. And then the uh, sacrificing for the unknown, which he's, you spoke about in the past, but you know, he's, yeah, he's writing all these articles. He's doing all kinds of stuff. He's like, at some point, this is going to pay off. But he <laughs> yeah. had no fucking clue. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, the student will find the teacher when he's ready. Another awesome quote. Mm -hmm. Fucking gold. We didn't uh, talk about this, but yeah, he was a, um, a scholarship uh, or a walk-on athlete at the University of Arizona. Uh, where he was a fullback and actually ended up being a starter and he played his varsity year. And I think he scored a touchdown like in the Rose Bowl. Whoa. If I remember correctly, or at least he played in the game in the Rose Bowl, which had like, you know, 60,000 fans or something yeah. wild like that. So shit. Yeah, he's done some shit, man. He, uh, he's been around and he was a, he was a really, really good athlete. I mean, to, to play division one football is, you know, not, uh, not an easy task. So, mm -hmm. and then he moved into powerlifting and when he, uh, was a power lifter. He did great at that. And then when he worked at elite, that's when he wrote five, three, one. So he's had, just like he's talking about with these kids, if they, if you can give them doses of success, then you can build upon that. Yeah. And, uh, that's exactly how his entire career has gone. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the structured ass kicking man. I like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it it's like, I think that kind of reiterates a lot of thoughts that I've been having about like, uh, multiple sports or trying to do multiple sports at the same time and being able to progress. Um, and like the building, just for focus on building muscle, mm -hmm. you know, like real quick on that point on focusing on building muscle. If, if there's anyone who listens, who does jujitsu, that's listening to this, or you play basketball or whatever, like uh, the big thing is like, if you're continuing to play your sport and let's say you're developing in the gym two or three days a week, but you're, you're, you're really playing your sport every single other day. The muscle you build, you're going to be using that when you're you're on the mats or when you're on the court, or when you're on the field. You're now using that that muscle to perform. So it's not like you're magically going to get bigger and and bulky and you're not going to be able to move. You're using that muscle through large ranges of motion. 
So that muscle is only going to be able to work for you in your sport. So it's, there's absolutely zero negatives to that. Mm. You know? Yeah. He, he's, uh, he's so basic too. I love that. You know, he yeah. goes back to basics and then the number that he came up with that he kept going back to was about 70%. And, and there might be some reasons to consider that, um, mainly who he's working with is athletes, but he also mentioned that in some of the other people that he works with that aren't young athletes, uh, that they had success, similar success, uh, using those lighter weights, you know? So <clears throat> it's something to just consider when you're training, like maybe your training's going good. Maybe you're already making progress. Uh, if you're making progress, you're not hurting yourself, mm -hmm. then I'd say carry on, you know, but I would at least have this in consideration. Maybe there's an easier, more optimal way to gain strength. And if you can do it with 70% rather than uh, overtaxing yourself with a hundred percent or, or potentially setting yourself up for injury, uh, why not, you know, look into a different style of training. I also like what he said about raising the, uh, you know, raising the floor rather than the ceiling. But I think that's a really tough one. Uh, you know, for me, the ceiling would be like my mobility, right? Mm. Uh, and uh, I guess like when I was a power lifter, you could say that the, um, the, the I'm sorry, the ceiling would be my strength, strength. And, and the floor would be my really? mobility, right? And uh, the easiest way to probably raise both would have probably been to have a little bit better mobility. Like, mm. it, it, like I don't know, because I didn't really mess with it much. Uh, I did meet Kelly Sturett, um while I was powerlifting and my numbers did shoot, shoot through the roof, but I wasn't really like, um, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't focused enough on mobility to really have like really good improvements, but I did improve my mobility in the lift that I was doing, which was a squat mm. and it paid off huge. I went from a 942 squat to a 1080 squat. And so if I would have kept that up, I think I got a little lazy with it and a little lax with it and didn't even recognize how much impact it had. And obviously there's multiple other reasons on why I got stronger. It's not just that, but, uh, that was a factor that was kind of thrown in there right when I got to, uh, some weights that kind of made everything a lot more challenging. Like he kind of referenced the Andy Bolton story, which was amazing because <laughs> here's a guy gaining five pounds on a, you know, deadlift that no one's ever done before. <laughs> and he's still getting criticism. Why did it take him so long to gain five pounds? Oh my God. It's pretty funny. It's kind of hilarious. I think there's still to this day only two people that have there's still only two people that have deadlifted a thousand pounds for in a in a powerlifting fashion. Oh, okay. Um strongman guys have done it, but they've done it with straps and sometimes with the eleven hundred pound pulls and stuff are done with different bars and Jamal, it's just it's yeah. just different. Jamal Browner's done it, but he had, he used straps. I think he pulled like a thousand forty or something. Damn. But he used to mean it's a thousand forty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but it was straps. But thousand forty. <laughs> yeah, no, it's unreal. I don't. <laughs> He'll have do any, it in the meet at some point. I don't have any issue with straps. I'm just saying, like in in a powerlifting competition, there's still only been yeah. Benedict Magnuson and Andy Bolton. No one else has ever pulled a thousand pounds. Just two guys, and so I mean, just the point there is, it's like he's at this crazy, crazy level of strength, yeah. and he gains five pounds, and people <laughs> like I don't understand. It's not good enough. But I do think that in general, uh, whether, whether you're somebody that is, you know, 400 pounds and you're way out of shape and you want to make a change, um, there is no diet that's going to allow you to lose 200 pounds, uh, in a month. No. It just, it doesn't really exist. Um, I think that people are wishing for stuff like that and they're hoping for stuff like that. But what I would say to that is I think you're better off wishing or hoping, um, for just a better skill set. And when you go through that, you become a different person in a lot of ways and you become a stronger person that has now armed themselves for success in many other areas of your life. And so even though it sucks and it's not easy to go through, um, I do think slow and steady is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Just taking your time with shit. And uh, if you mess up and you're going slow, what's it really, it doesn't really mm -hmm. do any, you don't have to be that worried about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're trying to go fast and you're trying to lose a lot of weight really quickly, um, that's where you end up with problems because you end up probably falling off the diet. If you're going to pray, if you're going to wish for anything, wish for the strength to be patient and wish for the courage Absolutely. to be consistent. Because as long as you have those two things, you're going to get there at some point. But if you don't, yeah, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, there's no 30-point shot in basketball right <laughs> you're still doing something when you're 50 
you mm-hmm. know, and you're, even if you're 30 now, I mean, still, that's 20 years, <sighs> man, you know, and you yeah. talk about, you know, playing instruments and stuff. Yeah. Right. I mean, you could, you'll just, I just think, uh, I think a lot of people are, um, they, they maybe are just like in, in a, in a rush. And I, I understand the, the anxiety and I understand, uh, the reasons on why they want to try to make a change so quickly. But, uh, as we know, with just so many other things, you can't, I hate the word can't, it's very difficult to make many changes all at one time, unless mm-hmm. you are somebody that has done that before. These fighters talking about going to these camps and these different things and football players going into camps and well, they've made a, a bunch of changes before they started to eat better uh, and train harder and run and lift and all these things before they're kind of a little bit more used to it. But even as Jim pointed out, like those were things they had to dial back yeah. because it was too much, even, even for, you know, kids that are 18, 19 or 16, 17, 18 years old, you know, mm-hmm. man. I'm so pumped after this. It was episode, fucking man. awesome. I'm so pumped right now, man. I'm gonna check out that manual too. Yeah, me too. I need it. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna buy that. He said it had everything in it. I want everything. I that's, what, that's what, <laughs> yeah. That's what I need. That's what I need. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. I will drink lmnt.com slash power project. I think all of us have element in our coffee today. I know I do. And Mark does. And I had, it, I had it in my tea. Let's go give blood so I can't take it. Oh. Yes, I'm gonna go get my blood drawn. Oh, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, two out of three is not bad. Uh, <laughs> you can actually sixty six percent is pretty bad. I don't, I don't do math. Just, just keep going, man. <laughs> I, don't, I think more than half is good. Anyways, right. drink elementy.com slash power project, pick up a value bundle. You're going to pay for three boxes and get a fourth one free. Hit up that uh, watermelon salt. And this, uh, ch- I forgot what the chocolate one's called. We'll just call it chocolate salt There's for now. There's a new flavor coming There's out, a new, new a flavor. Secret. Okay. Mm. So we're not supposed to know about that There's one because I don't even know about it. Let's yeah. just say Kai Green would like it. Huh? Oh. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll run with that uh links down in the description uh the podcast show notes as well as the youtube description please follow the podcast at mark bell's power project on instagram at mb power project on tiktok and twitter my instagram and twitter is at i am andrew z on tiktok at the andrew z and sima where you at why am I such a kid, man? I don't know. <laughs> and Sima Yin Yang on Instagram and YouTube at Sima Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Mark. I'm at Mark Smilly Bell and make sure you check out my Twitter. I mean, my TikTok. See how old I am. I'm getting yeah. all those things confused. Um, <clears throat> I've been posting a lot of shit up there and we had some success with a 1.1 million views on <laughs> the sound effects. Yes. So go check it out. Strength is never weak this week. This never strength. Catch you guys later. <laughs>